awareness about this topic because a lot of people in magnetism, biology, uh, corrosion science, engineering, they are like neglect the surface properties. And then usually that's, uh, for our perspective, a big mistake because the chemistry is going on on the surface. So if you don't know the chemical composition, if you don't know the structure, your starting model is like pretty like debil, right? So you, you're not gonna learn as much as uh, you can. And then that's why the talks that we have today are very like enlightening for, for, this, um, for this vision of science because the speakers are like trying to bring different methods and techniques to address these problems. Maybe it's not exactly the problem that you are working with in your postdoc or doctorate, but the tools, right? The concepts I think are the most important and that's the idea to bring this diversity of topics, right? So we have today uh, Professor Hans uh, Joachim Freund. Hi, you're here for, for the people that know him. Uh, and uh, he's just doing this uh, for many, many, uh, uh, many, many years and decades, actually. And we are glad that he is here to show some of the, the development that he's been doing in his uh, uh, department and now in his emeritus group in the Fritz Haber Institute in the Max Planck Gesellschaft. We have also Professor Libuda that's from the Erlang-Nuremberg uh, University that's dealing with uh, infrared spectroscopy applied to different uh, model systems for catalysis, for environmental science, and so on. We have Camila Codesu, our colleague from the Federal University of Rio, that work with also surface science of molecule adsorbent. Should move this way, otherwise, okay, people should sub talk here, right? Or they are, otherwise they're not in the uh, YouTube. Um, that is gonna talk about uh, like the growth of different like nano uh, structures based on uh, the bombardment with ion, ions on the surface. We have here our colleague Braulio Arcanjo that is a specialist in the transmission electron microscope that most of the people explore for, for, for bulk materials, but it's very powerful to understand the interface formation of solids. So we have some examples together. Uh, he's gonna bring today us uh, a bit about the, the nano manufacturing of tips that are very powerful to understand the surface properties of nanostructures like nanotubes, carbon nanotubes. So when you manufacture these tips, you have to learn about also the, what, they, what they're made of and then they you need tools for that. So he's gonna bring some of this information for us. And finally, I think it's on his way to, to here to the conference room, Professor Victor Caroso from the PUC University um, that's gonna talk about the 2D materials that he's growing there and investigate the Ram Raman properties. So we are gonna start first with uh, Hayo that we are happy to have him here again back in Rio. The computer. Okay, that, that's good. Then I can uh, try to read your, your CV here in uh, one or two hours and then <laughs> you're gonna be ready. But no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna say that uh, in a short um, term that his has his doctorate in a colon in physics and chemistry. It means that uh, he likes to prepare w very well um, um, defined samples as chemists like to prepare and like to measure in a very nice way like the physics uh, uh, side um, uh, the physicists like to do. So um, he's, he was a postdoc in Pennsylvania University, uh, did his habilitation in Cologne again, and then I was in Erlangen for a while as a professor there, like a visitor professor and later a full professor in Bochum. And then he in the mid-90s mid, uh, was... Uh, Guilherme, do you need some help? Do you need some help? Yeah, yeah? that's not working. I think you need this dongle here. Yeah, you can use the computer. Ah, okay, that's it. Ah. That's it. Yeah, it's you and I you have. Great. Then in the mid uh, um, uh, 90s, he did um, he did uh, start his uh, directorship then the Fritz Haber Institute, that is uh, uh, is the Institute of the Max Planck Society for Physical Chemistry, and this go back to to the Fritz Haber time and so on. And it was uh, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, Second Institute at that, that, that time. And um, there he was like uh, uh, founding a lot of, uh, employing a lot of techniques, new techniques that we use nowadays, uh, together with uh, a, a bunch of, of, of uh, group leaders that were like uh, supporting him on this endeavor. 
And then I think we're going to see some of these uh, developments there, uh, especially related to uh, scanning during microscopy, applied to silica films, and other examples that I think is going to be interesting for all of you. Right? So I, I encourage you to make questions, because we are not much here. And I also encourage people that are online to make questions, and then we see in the chat there. And then we try to make like uh, something that is interactive. So if you're also interested to work with colleagues uh, here in Brazil or in, in Germany, I, I invite you to approach them after the talks, during the coffee break, right? And then to make more questions and show up, right? So if everything's fine. No, no, she's up. Oh, yeah. Can you teach me so that she has more time? So great. So let's have Hayo Fan here with us now. Thank you, Hayo. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here again uh, in uh, in Rio. Has been quite some time before uh, that I came here, but due to the pandemic, I mean, people were not traveling. This this is my first trip in two and a half years. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, thanks uh, to Fernando for uh, organizing this. 
Uh, I will be talking about model systems and heterogeneous catalysis, and we are trying to elucidate the properties of these systems at the atomic scale. Um, the um, uh, talk will be after a very short brief introduction uh, uh, on two conceptual studies that we recently investigated, and uh, you will see what that means if you don't understand the words now, surface action spectroscopy using messengers, and the second one is reactions in confined space. What we are uh, doing is, uh, as I said, trying to understand uh, uh, certain features in heterogeneous catalysis, and for that, um, we are trying to uh, develop model systems that we can actually um, investigate at the atomic scale. So we sort of know where the atoms are. That gives us the help, the, the possibility to also ask the help of theorists because they can build up models that directly correspond to the experimentally tested systems. That's a big advantage when you think of real catalysts that have an extremely complex uh, structure uh, and, and then you do uh, you do model calculations. Uh, am I not using it properly, or? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and and you think of these things. They try to model um, a complex system with a simple calculation. Then you can have doubts whether that really represents the system you're looking at. And so we're trying to uh, circumvent that problem, and we have developed sort of a uh, a strategy going from very simple uh, uh, small clusters uh, that could uh, already mimic some chemistry through single crystals of metals, oxides, and then going to real to systems that already contain um, 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 features that you find in catalysts. You know, catalysts are uh, typically have a support, often an oxide, and then they have small metal particles on top. And uh, the reason why we used uh, oxides and metal single crystals before, we thought we can, we can mimic uh, the properties of the metal by using a metal single crystal. Now, to some extent, that is true. And as you may know, there was a no Nobel Prize given for that approach to Gerhard Adel, my colleague at the Fritz Haber Institute. Um, but the problem is, of course, that the, uh, the uh, electronic properties of these small metal particles uh, are different from uh, those of single crystals. Uh, simply of the, due to the its, its nano size, and so you have to take that into account. Also, uh, there is uh, an interaction between these particles and the substrate, which would, would again change the, the properties. And in order to mimic that, we're using these models with a higher degree of complexity than those models before to uh, uh, approach the properties of uh, single crystals. You can also have oxides when you when you put metal particles onto them oxides that actually cover up the metal particle. People in catalysis call this strong metal support interaction, which is another feature that you find in real catalysts. And so we're trying by increasing the complexity of the model system to finally approach uh, uh, the real catalysts and understand their uh, chemical properties. And we try to do this by, by combining experiment uh, and theory and uh, the red and the green marks uh, indicated seven years ago where we thought theory and experiments stand. So that's sort of the approach. Now, uh, the conceptual approach. The experimental approach is based on, uh, on an approach uh, 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 dealing with thin oxide films. You know oxides are often insulators. In surface science, we're using um, tools that use electrons, photoelectron spectroscopy or such, and they are uh, only uh, best applied to, to non-insulating systems. So if you have insulators, you get charge up, you cannot really determine the binding energies properly. And so uh, in order to circumvent that, we are putting um, uh, oxide, thin, uh, thin oxide films on top of a single crystal metal uh, so that
uh, you get the equivalent to an infrared spectrum. And now you can uh, choose example, if, if for example, here for a gold seven cluster is, is work taken from the Felix and Meyer group in the Fritz Haber Institute. Um, uh, you, can, you can have these, um, uh, these various clusters that you can make deliberately in a, in a, in a, in a, um, in a, um, in a molecular beam. And then you can, um, uh, then you can uh, compare which one fits best to the calculations. These are the calculations here, and this is the actual measurement. And you can see the fitting is best to this cluster. It's a gold seven cluster, very asymmetric. So we can determine uh, from that infrared spectrum uh, the structure of these clusters. And that's very difficult otherwise because the concentration of the cluster is so small that any other structural uh, determination wouldn't work. So we, we thought that this is easily applicable to surfaces because we can cool down surfaces to low temperatures, uh, uh, ad absorb uh, rare gas atoms. Dietrich Menzel has done this uh, for many surfaces many years ago. And since we have a free electron laser at the Fritz Haber Institute, we can, and that was work, th whoops, and, and this work was already done with it, um, we can scan the frequency over the appropriate range uh, and that's not so easy with a lab-based uh, uh, laser uh, and, um, and have the uh, sufficient intensity. And so we can do this uh, for, for, the, for surfaces. And here is a schematic. So we take a surface, we absorb the rare gases on them, we irradiate it with an infrared uh, pre-electron laser beam, and we, we record the mass spectrometer, the mass spectra, as a function of the frequency of the laser. Here is the setup. It's a normal UHV machine. Here is the, uh, the setup of the free electron laser. I don't have to go into the details, but uh, uh, that has also been modified nowadays to, to spread the, uh, the infrared, the uh, spectral region. And, uh, and this is just a simple sample, the, the, the sample arrangement. We have a sample here. We have the mass spec that is appropriately cooled and screened and so forth so that we record uh, the, proper, the proper spectrum. And here is the frequency range of the uh, free electron laser. And you can, you can see we can go over uh, quite a range uh, uh, in the infrared region. So the first example I would like to show you is an example uh, that we used as a test. Uh, that is uh, the surface of uh, V2O3, vanadium trioxide. Uh, and that film is grown on a gold 111 surface. There was a huge debate in the literature that was finally solved uh, by Felix Feiten, one of my uh, uh, PhD students, to show that the, uh, one, the, the 0001 surface of vanadium oxide is actually terminated by vanadium atoms that carry individual oxygen atoms, so-called so vanadyl groups, an oxygen doubly bond, bound to a vanadium group underneath. And these vanadyl groups are only present at the surface. They are not present in the bulk structure of the V2O3. So it is a very surface-specific structural element that we can use to test how surface-sensitive um, this uh, surface action spectroscopy may be. Uh, here is an SDM of the surface, and you can see um, the details. The, the blobs are the vanadyl groups, and there are also uh, dark uh, spots. Those are places where that vanadyl group is missing. And you will see in a minute why I show you this because here is now a set of spectra. It's a very busy slide. On the left-hand side, <coughs> you see surface action spectra only. And on the right-hand side, you see a comparison between surface action spectroscopy and, um, and other uh, surface uh, uh, vibrational spectra. I come back to that in a minute. But let's, let's look at this. This is the, um, this is the, um, the action spectrum. And, and, and uh, this action spectrum is actually taken by putting neon onto the surface. And you will see in a minute that it's actually relevant to know uh, which uh, rare gas you, you, you use because you, in some cases, taking any other air rare gas atom, it doesn't work at all. And I will try to explain to you why that is. So here is the, the, uh, uh, the, ra the surface action spectrum, very strong line of the vanadyl group, an extra little bump, I'll come back to this. Uh, there is a defect-related structure, another defect-related structure, and this is um, a, an oxide uh, surface polariton that is coupling the surface to the bulk. 
if you put iron onto this, you decorate the surface and all of these peaks are gone and you only see uh, a, a peak that is related to the iron, or if you put adsorbates on, you have the similar situation. So it's a very surface sensitive technique. Now how does that compare to other spectroscopic techniques? And that's shown here on the right hand side. This is, this is the action spectrum. I told you that if you use a different rare gas atom, such as uh, argon, there is nothing to see. So the question is, why is that? And then I'll come back to that. And here is the infrared spectrum. Now, the problem with infrared spectra is that you usually have to take them with respect to a reference spectrum. So you take the difference or the quotient between two spectra. And that gives rise to this so-called positive peaks and these negative peaks. And you see here is the Van der Waals group, and it has a negative peak on top. So it's something that was there before, but you don't know what. In this case, we have a bump there. And I showed you the STM. What is it? Well, it's those Van der Waals groups that are closer to a, a, a missing one. Because if you have two uh, uh, vibrating oscillators, they couple. And they shift the frequency upward. So if you have one missing, then the shift is downward, right? So those Van der Waals groups that have a missing one next to it will be shifted downwards, a few of them. And that's this peak. So by, by not having to record a reference spectrum, you have the advantage that you can see what is there before and what is there after you have done what you try to do. Now, here is a, an EEL spectrum, electron energy loss spectrum, which is also typically used in surface science. And you can also see the Van der Waals group, but you can see it has very low intensity, while the surface polariton here is enormous. And that has to do with the fact that this is a strongly dipole active uh, situation, but it's coupled to the bulk. And you can see this in our setup uh, by looking at the temperature. We have uh, put a thermal element to the system, and you can see when you excite that, the energy flows into the bulk and the temperature goes up. While in the other, in the other cases, it doesn't go up. So uh, uh, surface action spectroscopy is very surface sensitive. And what I, what I need to explain to you is why is a neon so active and argon isn't? But if you think a bit about it, it, it probably comes to your mind what the problem is. What are we doing? We are exciting a vibrational band, band of the group. And that energy is needed to desorb the rare gas from, from the surface. What, on, on which property does a rare gas surface interaction, which is dispersive, so to speak, depend on its mass? The heavier it is, the more energy you need to remove the particle. So you have to test, and you want to go to the lightest messenger that you can get. So you want to go to helium. But that means you have to cool the sample properly. And we have done this, and it works, but it's still in the doing. I'll tell you in a minute why that is, could be an interesting point. Uh, but you can also use, for example, molecular hydrogen, or molecular deuterium, or HD because at that temperature they do not react. And they sit on this thing and they can, you can dissolve them. And we've shown you can do this. And I show you spectra uh, in a minute. But that's the way we do these things. And, and elu elucidating that mechanism in more detail is something where we interact with theorists to look into uh, more of the details. Um, here is another example. It's uh, uh, iron oxide. It's actually an FeO film <coughs> grown uh, on a substrate, in this case on platinum, it forms this bilayer, an iron layer and an oxygen layer on top, has been studied in the late uh, 80s in the Samarjai group and, and so forth. And it forms this wonderful uh, structure. It has uh, this lattice mismatch which leads to this so-called moiré pattern in the lead and you can do high resolution SDM and so forth. But it grows in patches. And so um, uh, it is important to, to look at it with different um, spectroscopies. Uh, and you can see here uh, the high resolution of the surface action spectrum. This is, um, this is done uh, with, hydrogen atom, uh, uh, with hydrogen atoms. And you can see in this case, neon doesn't work, simply because the energy of the excitation is lower. Right? So we don't have enough energy uh, available to do the desorption properly, in, in contrast to the other one. And so uh, and here is, this is why neon is flat and hydrogen shows all these features. Eels is much, uh, the resolution is low. 
and, and, and so uh, there is no co direct comparison uh, uh, possible. But here you can see uh, that is not only true for H2, but it can be also true for uh, using uh, isotopically changed uh, messengers. You can get details, and you can try to understand the, de the, the difference, the detailed differences, and get deep insight into these, uh, into these systems. Another example where we had looked into the surface termination uh, is uh, iron uh, uh, magnetite Fe304111, uh, because the question was for years, what is the termination? Uh, uh, in other words, if you create the 111 surface, which of these possible terminations is the right one? And there were for years where people assuming it is the octahedral termination. And if we do now, uh, our study, and here uh, and various uh, uh, oxides or preparations are compared. This, this is our Fe304 fully, uh, well, this is this uh, uh, preparations in between. That's the FeO film I showed you before. And this is a, a, um, a so-called biphase of Fe304, which is, if you may call it, an Fe203 patch on an Fe304 surface. And you can see the lead patterns, and you can directly see the differences in the surface action spectroscopy. So if you have a tool that is calculations uh, to uh, de de for a detailed eluc elucidation of the surface phonon structure, you can definitely determine what the structure of these relatively complex systems is. And here is the direct comparison between calculations from the Zauer and Paya group with uh, the measured Fe304 spectrum. Here is the tetrahedral calculation. Here is the octahedral calculation. Here is uh, uh, water absorption. Very clear, the termination is surface tetrahedral one. So the, the iron atoms in the surface are tetrahedrally coordinated, no question. And that's now the accepted termination of the surface. This is something uh, people had discussed on the basis of lead other things for years. So. We started, however, out, and I told you this, uh, by looking at clusters. And, and there is an experiment that still needs to be done that could be rather interesting. Consider gold clusters on the surface as in comparison to the gold clusters in the gas phase. They have phonons at very low energy, right? Because they're heavy atom, heavy metal. And this metal, if you put that on the surface of a substrate of an oxide, the oxide phonon, surface phonon, will swamp the thing completely. So if you did a typical infrared experiment, you would not be able to even see the vibrations from the clusters on the surface. So with action spectroscopy, however, you have the chance, if you can control the surface temperature in detail, you can, you can put a rare gas on, that's, that's sort of schematically shown here. If you control the surface, you can, because of the interaction of the rare gas with the metal is different from the oxide, you can remove the stuff from the substrate and have all the, uh, the rare gases only absorbed on the cluster. And if you knew, now do surface action, you see exclusively the spectrum of the gold clusters. And that can then be directly compared to, the, but for this, you need helium cooling, uh, and that's not a, a trivial thing to do because you need to do, you need to go to, so it's something like one or two Kelvin. And we're, we're almost there, but not quite. Okay, so it, it, but it's possible, and it will open up possibilities. You can also use a real catalyst, and if you manage to decorate with rare gases only certain features, you can isolate them from the rest, and in a complex system, just look at the things that interest you. So there is a certain potential to this technique. So this... Uh, So um, I have time enough to go into uh, the second part. Um, uh, we have been uh, trying to look at, um, uh, at the question, what can surface science do to look at reactions that happen in the volume of systems? You know, you probably know, uh, in, in, in catalysis, zeolites are very important catalysts, right? but all the action in, in zeolites happens in the interior of the crystal. And that's not surface science, right? So what the, how the hell can we get some information in principle on what happens in these cavities? Even not 
exactly on the zeolite, but what, how does a cavity influence the chemistry of a reaction? And that's what we call reaction in confined space. And chemical engineers have developed um, 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 very imp important um, uh, sort of systematic strategies to, uh, to, to predict what is happening, but that's not based on atomic knowledge, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and so um, uh, it could be interesting uh, to work on this. And so we have started to do this uh, by, of course, by accident. And the accident occurred because we were studying um, uh, 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 something that is called a silica bilayer. I will come back to this. But before I do this, I would like to show you, and that's important to realize, we are not the first to talk about this. Have been, people have been talking about this. In particular, Sina Bao in China, uh, who was used to be working at Dalian, he was uh, actually uh, 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 a guest scientist with Gerhard Ertel in Berlin. Uh, uh, he, he and his, his group have looked at uh, reactions in uh, carbon nanotubes uh, underneath uh, graphene films uh, shown here uh, in single wall nanotubes. Other people have done this as well. I can't go into the details. The point is that in, this, in all these cases, uh, the molecules enter the system sort of from the edge, right? I mean, the, the, the graphene flake is too dense on top, so no molecules can go in. They have to crawl under the surface by this. But we are interested, if you think about zeolites, for example, you want to have a membrane, that is a, a lattice part, where the gas m m uh, molecules can penetrate through that membrane and reach the active site. And, uh, and, and so this uh, is actually, with, as I will show you in a minute, this is possible with this uh, silica film. So a little bit more to the silica film. Uh, this is a very early <coughs> um, uh, experiment we did. You see here a lead pattern of a crystalline film, and you see here the structure of the film uh, cr uh, on the surface. It's crystalline, and it consists of these things that turn out to be hexagons. I'll show you a schematic in a second. But the point is that this, uh, this structure depends very much on the preparation conditions. If you change the preparation conditions, you can have the same silica, but it's no longer crystalline, it's amorphous. Typical lead pattern here. And with the SDM, we can see what the structure is. This is a two-dimensional film. So we can actually look at uh, vitreous or amorphous silica. And amorphous silica has represented a problem for structural determination for decades. And I'll come back to this in a minute. But, but this is the, the situation. So here is the, the silica film. When we started out, <coughs> we, uh, we built a silica film uh, with that we call a monolayer. And this, this monolayer uh, consists of a silicon atom in the middle, four uh, tetrahedrally surrounding oxygen atoms. And in the monolayer, one oxygen atom is bound to the metal surface underneath. That's the one we are preparing it on. <coughs> and if you look at the infrared spectrum, you see this very strong silicon oxygen metal infrared absorption. If you choose different conditions, <coughs> you can create a bilayer film. And you can think of that bilayer film by cutting this thing off flipping it over and putting a second one on top. While the stoichiometry of this, it has the same hexagonal structure, but the stoichiometry of this one is SiO2.5, or SE, SiO2.5. This one is SiO2. If you count the number of atoms uh, within, the si within the unit cell, so there's per perfect SiO2, silica. And you can see here in the blue spectrum, these uh, uh, metal uh, vibrations are completely missing. So there are only silicon uh, uh, vibrations uh, seen uh, in it. And the film, in fact, is uh, bound by dispersive forces to the substrate. So uh, you can have something in between here, but in principle, you can have this pure metal and the silica sitting on top. The silica provide these pores, so small molecules like CO or H2 can diffuse through the pores and then react with a metal surface. And that, to me, was an elementary step to start to look at confinement of these reactions. Because you can take, you can take that film off, and you have the open reaction, and compare it directly with the one after you put the, the lid on top, right? 
so you can have a direct comparison of the two. Now, here comes something that we were, we were fascinated by. When you look at that structure that I showed you, where we have this vitreous structure as well, uh, Markus Haider, one of my group leaders, has uh, uh, created uh, an instrument uh, where you can do on the same atom, non-contact AFM and SDM. So he used, um, uh, um, you know, this, uh, uh, the, the, the SDM tip that is mounted on a tuning force tip, so you can use the tuning force for AFM and use a little wire to do SDM in the same spot. And you can see it here. This is the vitreous part and recorded both with AFM and SDM. It's the same, uh, uh, the same region. And you can see the AFM is uh, sensitive to the silicon atoms, while the SDM is sensitive to the oxygen atoms. So we, if you put the two on top, you get a map that is chemically specific and atomically resolved. And when you, look, when you think this, you found something new, it's always good to look in the literature. If you do that and you look at Jacks from 1932, Bill Sakaryasin, a Norwegian immigrant to Minnesota, had proposed the structure of amorphous silica that was never in real space detected. Here, you ha here it is. So it's always good to look back not only five years, but maybe 100 years sometimes, right? So anyway, so you can, you can, you can get that, and that allows you to uh, think about, uh, can we actually look at the atomic scale uh, f for the vitreous uh, crystal transition. So if we can make an SDM fast enough, huh, then we can perhaps even see how that thing rearranges. That would be interesting. Uh, and uh, as sort of in, an intermezzo before I come to the reactions, I wanted to show you this. This is uh, the silica film crystalline. Here it is amorphous. So you can ask the question, if you go through that interface, which are the ring sizes that appear first. And it turns out that if you do this sort of by looking at it, it's always five and seven membered rings. And that rings a bell where those people who have done, who have looked at two dimensional systems. Because for graphene, uh, the so called stone whales defect has been predicted to be the first defect created in a graphene film. And the graphene has, remember, also hexagonal rings. So what we did, we used our, um, uh, our LEAM and PEAM instrument to do, do a, a lead study. This is the crystalline structure. This is the amorphous structure. And we have just, not on an atomic scale, but, uh, but uh, mesoscopically, looked at the changes in the intensity as a function of temperature to plot an Arrhenius plot. And you get this plot here. This is then the apparent activation energy for the process going from the crystalline to the amorphous film. The activation energy, as you can read there, is 4.2 electron volts. Boom. Stone whales. When you do the calculation for graphene, it's actually rather close, but uh, Marek Sierka in Jena has done, um, the, uh, has done the calculation. You see a little movie. Uh, you go from, um, from s uh, four six-membered rings by opening the, f the interior one, to eventually to two five and two seven member rings. That's the stone whales. And we believe that that is what's happening. And what we're working out now is to try to see that at the atomic scale. And that's what we do with a new SDM. That is something we are building up. Uh, the student was with me in Manaus. We had this meeting in Manaus last week. And he has been able to set up an, an SDM uh, that is about um, uh, um, a factor of 100 uh, to uh, 200 faster than any SDM that has been built so far. And he uses a special approach. He used not the typical approach in SDM is you scan like this, but you do a spiral scan. This is not new. The people have suggested that before. But if you implement it and you have clever uh, computer people who can write codes to, to analyze it, you can actually do that very fast. And you can see, here is a standard SDM. You can see clearly the atomic resolution. This is not manipulated so that you see beautiful blobs. It's the real stuff, right? And, and here on the side, whoops, that should have been a movie, but it doesn't work. 
Ah, oh, that's too bad. I don't know how to. No. Uh, anyway, um, uh, had the movie worked, this is scanning very fast, and you can see these vacancies here hopping around the surface in real time. And this is basically an oxygen, this is oxygen and oxygen adsorbate on ruthenium. And you can even see the oxygen sitting in metastable states. That was never possible before. So it hops into an intermediate place and then it hops to another place. That's the problem with a stick. You can't see the movie, sorry about that. But uh, the, that, that would be the thing. And, and, and Leonard was able to do this. And we think we're now set uh, so that we can record one image in one millisecond. And so we have a chance, if we can stabilize the situation at high temperature, to see the transformation in real space. Here, now we are back to the reaction. What we are planning to, or what we have done, is we have used this membrane uh, and diffuse hydrogen through the membrane and put at the interface oxygen. Right? And we put uh, oxygen at the interface in such a way that this, the ruthenium surface, in this case, is completely saturated with oxygen. So when the hydrogen diffuses through and it doesn't find a defect where is an open, where is a, an oxygen atom missing, um, it will not react. But if it finds a defect, it will start to dissociate and the reaction stops. And we can then um, try to follow that reaction. And we do this uh, with our uh, uh, machine where we, that sits at the synchrotron, we call it the smart machine. Um, uh, this is the x-rays from the synchrotron, so you can do photo emission with the synchrotron. This is a, uh, uh, a, divi a, a, divi a dividing uh, uh, electronics so that we can not only the electron beam from created by the synchrotron radiation, but also from an electron uh, gun and do electron scattering. This is an aberration correction mirror. So this is, if you want an aberration corrected electron microscope. And then you can do electron analysis, and you can record a two-dimensional XPS spectrum uh, throughout uh, the experiment in situ while you do the experiment. And this movie fortunately runs, and you can see the reaction running across the surface. The dark part, as you will see, is uh, where the oxygen atoms are still there, and the white part is uh, where the oxygen atoms are gone and the white part is where the oxygen atoms are still on the surface, so where the reaction proceeds. And it, it starts from the corner because that is a place where the reaction starts where the defect was in the oxygen layer on the surface. And you can then, uh, you can, when you look at this, you will see closely, it stops a little bit when it comes through these, these lines here, which are, which are um, uh, step bunches on the surface. Right? Uh, and so you can then use that, and uh, you can then here, um, um, record, for example, XPS spectra. You can stop it at any time, and you can look at the, the XPS spectrum. This is color-coded here, and you see uh, where the black color is the, where the, um, uh, the oxygen are still on the surface, and the red one is where it's gone. And then you can plot the, the, the velocity of that reaction zone as a function of temperature, and you can do this for both for the uh, crystalline and for the vitreous film, and there's not much of a difference concerning apparent activation energy. It's around 0.3 electron volts. Now, Dietrich Menzel, again, had 30 years ago, 50 or 20 years ago, had measured that reaction in open space, so we didn't even have to do that. But we did that, and we reproduced his value, and it's 0.6 EV. It's a factor of two. And if you talk to a chemical engineer, yeah, diffusion control. That's what it is. That's what they would say, because it, you can read it in textbooks. But what is the reason for the diffusion control? Which is the, the, the step that controls the, the reaction? That's the question. And you cannot use the experiment here to solve, to, 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 to solve that problem. You have to do calculations. And, and so um, uh, Joachim Payer and Joachim Sauer and uh, Tom Mullen and Dennis Uzviat Together with uh, Mark Schluto, I cannot stress that enough, who is a, a theoretical physicist who works on atmospheric chemistry. He is used to solving very complex um, uh, nonlinear equation systems. And you have that here because you have n steps that you need to combine, and you need to model them such that it reproduces the experiment. 
right? And they have done ab initio, I mean DFT calculations. Uh, so here is a, a, a very busy, busy thing. Here is the, the, the energetics. Uh, this is the energies, and here are the free energies. So taking the, the um, entropy and so forth into account. And you can see the, the, st the rate determining step is the OH formation, that is this thing. And it doesn't change for the free, ener the free surface. Okay, and the, um, uh, and the uh, other surface. So it's not, as people thought, uh, an influence on the, on the transition state that creates the reaction. And you have to go through all the steps in detail, and I don't have the time to go into the details, but turns out what is the, c the, 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 the most important step? The most important step is the diffusion of the hydrogen on the surface. Because, as I said, the oxygen layer um, keeps the hydrogen from dis dissociating so that the hydrogen has to diffuse across the surface to find an open sp uh, place to diffuse. And if you do that, you can explain these data quantitatively. And um, uh, there are still things that need to be understood. The, 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 the reaction front has different width, which probably also has to do with this diffusion, which I don't have time to get into. But we can certainly identify the crucial steps for a reaction in confined space with direct comparison to open space. Here are the, cur the, uh, the calculations in comparison to the experiment. The energetics are perfect, but the uh, frequency factors are not yet fine, and that has to do with the um, not fully understood influence on the width of the reaction front. So, with that, I close. I hope I have shown you that uh, with action spectroscopy, uh, we can uh, look at the vibrational properties of surfaces with very high sensitivity and get some novel information. And we can have also demonstrated that if you choose the system right, we can, uh, we can contribute with surface science to understand things uh, reactions in confined space, and we can now make not only silica films, but also alumo silica films that resemble zilica, uh, zeolites more, and do this. So with this, I would like to stop. This is the uh, group that I was running when I was still in office. I'm retired now since uh, April tw 2019. Uh, we had support from, uh, still have support from the European Research Council. And we have many, many people from uh, Alexander von Humboldt uh, Foundation funded fellows, Humboldt awardees, and so forth. Uh, all these people have done the work, and they should get all the credit. Here is the picture of our last meeting. And uh, Jörg, for example, is also somewhere huh? on the right-hand side, yeah. And uh, I don't know whether, whether uh, Fernando was there at the time, but I don't think so. Uh, anyway, these people uh, have done all the work, uh, and uh, I'm really grateful to them. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hi, for your wonderful talk. Um, what they're doing here in this picture is not clear for me. What's this here? They're like holding something, Hi. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, if you, you see on the right-hand side, the person who holds the finger is uh, Günther Hoprechter, and he is from Vienna. And there is always a competition between Vienna and Salzburg, because, you know, Mozart lived in Salzburg and went for, to Vienna from time to time, and uh, he invented a chocolate, and it's called the, the Mozart sphere. And uh, Günther brought uh, uh, 50 of these Mozart spheres and built a cluster of it and said, these are so round, we can, it will held, it will hold together so it can form a cluster. And a Salzburg uh, 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 Mozart sphere would never do that. And that's why we hold this up. And you know, we have also people from Salzburg. I will not identify those. <laughs> Martin Sterrer, who is not here, is, is not from Salzburg, but he studied also in Salzburg, in, in, no, no, in not really, I mean, whatever. Uh, the point is that this was the, the, the thing they hold up, and that explains the third. Yeah, the kind third, of. Third step. This is, it has to do with the action spectros for the cluster physics yeah. as well, right? So, <laughs> fine. So, guys, I have questions. I guess you as well. Let's, let's start for someone here, or if there is something on the internet. I think Roberto can check. Something that you want to learn. Everybody understood about action spectros. So, something that I'm interested in there is, is, interested there is um, do you see um, that people can uh, employ this kind of technique with ordinary samples? 
not the, the nice ones that we used to grow in the lab, so, but the conventional like catalysts, do you think so? If you can cool them down to helium temperature. Right, okay, I see. Yeah, because it should be like homogeneous, right? So if it's like a body that's, oh, see, I see. Uh, and another one is, is related to the, the vanadyl group, no, not vanadyl, the ferro new group. Right, the, the double auction bound to the iron. Right, but uh, later on you also uh, show us that the also a group that is the ferro new is the response. Ah, uh, okay. I see, I see. Right, because I mean like at the end of the day, this all a complex, not complex oxide, but that this is a high oxidation state of the oxide. And then like the, the, the vanadium oxide was a big debate with all house news as well by, by in that time. What's the termination? So there is, I would expect for all these like co cobalt oxide and manganese oxide that this is the termination of all these films, or what do you think? Well, the, the, you, you can have on real samples, you may have this ferro groups. That's what I, where I asked the question in the lab tour, mm -hmm. um, uh, whether you have that. And that would be a way to find out, right? right. Uh, without having a full structure. If you can cool the system down and you have a uh, free electron laser at your availability. So that's not trivial. I see, I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because you comment as well that the laser, the people can do that in the laser setup, not so powerful, but... I never saw something like that. Right, in the energy. Right. Um, if we have one more question. Okay, please. I don't know if I'm allowed to, but uh, I was wondering, you, you showed this uh, kinetic simulations in the end, and you said uh, you, you are fitted uh, on uh, the, the rate equations um, at the same time, and you had some uh, theoretical input. And I was not really sure uh, what are the fitting parameters and what is the, what is the thing that you get from theory. Fitting parameters are the, uh, the frequency factors, if you like, so that go into the, in the, into the uh, rate constants. And they were fitted, but the energetics were, were kept constant. But there were other things. So you, you, the, the situation is too complex to do everything uh, from, from the start. Not quite yet, no. They are th but they are only off by an order of magnitude. For prefactors, that's not so much. between the experiment and the theory. If you, 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 you compare the, the cut with the zero. The prefactor. Yes, they are calculated from theory and they, yeah, because what we think, we think that, um, that the reason is that we have not fully understood the influence of the width of the reaction front. Right. So, if we don't have more questions, so let's thank Hayo again. Thank you. <laughs> so, we're now moving on, and uh, we're going to have now the talk of Dr. Professor Camila Codeso from the Federal University of Rio. She's uh, did uh, her uh, doctorate and, and postgrad studies in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, dealing with like this, uh, I think some of the subject that she's going to bring to us as well, like the preparation of this um, um, surface with uh, uh, ion bombardment and so on. But then later on, she moved to the, the uh, um, no, our national light source, the Sucretron, NLS in Campinas, and did this uh, postdoc there working with, uh, in the PGMB line, as far as I know, and then worked with adsorption of molecules on surface, and also did some like very interesting and some of the new uh, capability that is available in the, wor in, the in, in the national lab that is based on infrared spectroscopy with tears with tip enhanced so it's a very po powerful technique and a new one uh, and I think she's going to talk about this subject for us as well right so let's thank uh, Camila and please take the stage. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Camila Codesso, and uh, I will talk about the surface physics from atom adsorption to the synthesis of nanoscale patterns. Uh, I am working at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and uh, here I presented uh, some pictures of uh, the main campus where the Physics Institute is located. 
And uh, here I present a picture with uh, professors and uh, students from Physics Institute. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation, and uh, in this presentation, I will talk about uh, two different topics that uh, involve the surface science and uh, topics that I, I have been working on. So the first topic that I would like to talk is the synthesis of uh, self-assembly nanostructures induced by ion beam irradiation. So uh, how from an ion beam, a large ion beam, we can, uh, can we synthesize structures of uh, this type? And the next topic that I would like to talk is about uh, the adsorption of uh, oxygen and hydroxyl on silver surface and the, the spectroscopic signature of the hydroxyl and the oxygen. So let's start with the first topic, the superficial silicon nanostructure synthesized by ion beam radiation. So uh, silicon is a, a material, a larger material used in the industry, and uh, we know that the silicon nanostruct, uh, nanocrystal sorry, has the photoluminescence effect. There are many pathways to synthesize the silicon nanostructures, and one pathway to synthesize it is by disproportionation reaction. So we can start by a, a silicon suboxide and induce a phase separation and separation uh, and, and, and uh, induce a phase separation and separate into silicon dioxide and silicon. And in this work, I will use the ion beam radiation technique, a top-down technique, to induce this phase separation in a silicon dioxide thin film. So here I present the result from Saxena, which shows the synthesis of a silicon nanocrystals by ion beam radiation. So here I show a transmission, uh, transmission microscopy image as a function of uh, the ion beam fluence, and we can notice the synthesis of a silicon nanocrystals. Here I show the photoluminescence uh, effect as a function of, uh, of uh, the ion beam fluence, and we can note that from the pristine film, the black curve, we can increase the intensity of the photoluminescence in the case of the irradiated film. If we continue to increase the ion beam fluence, the, the intensity of the peak decreases. So in this case, we have an optimal value of ion beam fluence, which contributes to increase the, the intensity of the photoluminescence. So uh, let's talk about the ion beam spurring technique, the technique that I, I will use in this work. So when, a, when an ion beam hits on a material surface, the spurring process takes place. The spurring process is the ejection of a particles from the surface. And depending on some parameters like a beam energy, uh, incidence angle, fluence, diffusion constants, we can induce the formation of uh, structures by self assemble patterns. And uh, what kind of uh, patterns can we synthesize? So here I show some examples. Uh, we have a sample composed by gold and titanium thin film, covered a silicon substrate, and irradiated with, uh, with a cesium ions. So in the first case, we have structures like a mount, which are 10 nanometers long, structures like a hole with uh, 500 deep, and uh, structures uh, like a duetting pattern. And I would like to call the attention that in both, in all these cases, I didn't use and focus ion beam or masks. So it's a self-assembled structure. Uh, the physical mechanisms involved in this process are not totally clear. We know that there is a competition between the spurring process and the diffusion process on the surface. And from this competition, a new characteristic length appears on the surface. And uh, this is an area of intense research, and uh, I present some, some papers here. Uh, the, uh, the experimental setup that I will use in this experiment is an electrostatic ion accelerator. We performed some, um, uh, we adapted this accelerator to perform the, the radiation inside the ion source, and we can use the accelerator as a mass spectrometer. So the ion source is a source of negative ions by cesium spurring. The sample is placed at the cathode position. The cesium is heated, ionized, and then accelerated in direction of the sample surface. And then the spurring process occurs. Here I present a schematic image of the picture uh, before the, 
the, the irradiation. So our sample is composed by a silicon dioxide fin film covered a silicon substrate. So we performed some simulations about the effect of the irradiation on the sample using the serine software. And uh, here I show that the cesium ions pen penetrate six nanometers deep. So it is closer to the surface and it's increased the spewing, the spewing process on the surface. We have, we have uh, oxygen preferential spurring, so we change the stoichiometry from, from silicon, sub silicon dioxide to silicon suboxide. And uh, after the, the radiation, the physical acting of the ion beam reaches 50 micrometers, and we will analyze the structures that are synthesized on this surface. Uh, another effect of the radiation is create defects on the sample. And uh, here I presented uh, an, a graph of uh, the number of defects per volume. And uh, we will see that these defects create a specific signature in the infrared spectra. Now I will present some results of uh, AFM. Here, uh, after the irradiation, we can note that concentric rings appear on the surface, and these concentric rings are related to the Gaussian profile of the ion beam. Here I show a part of a one ring highlighted with, uh, with a black dot, and uh, in the letter B, I presented a zoom of uh, this black square. So uh, we can note that the border of uh, the ring is a transition region. We synthesize many structures inside the ring. If I will look at one of uh, these structures, we can note that uh, it has this shape with a faced side and, are we and, and, a flat, and, a, and a flat top. In letter D, sorry. In letter D, I present the same image of a letter B, but in two dimensions. And uh, we can look to the height profile of uh, the surface. So this white line corres cor corresponds to this height profile on the graph. And uh, we can note that inside the ring, the structures can reach up 40 nanometers long, and outside the ring, the structures can, re can reach up 5 nanometers long. So we synthesize the structures inside and outside the ring, but uh, yeah, they have different, uh, different heights. Here I presented a synchrotron infrared nanospectroscope. So uh, the blue curve corresponds to the pristine silicon dioxide. And uh, in, this in this spectra, we can uh, identify the stretch modes, the asymmetric stretch modes, which is composed by asymmetric stretch in phase and out of a phase, so AS1 and AS2, and the symmetric stretch, which is the double S. If uh, we start the radiation, if uh, we increase the intensity of uh, the ion beam influence, the, the physical etching reaches uh, the different thickness. And uh, we can note that uh, the asymmetric stretch, the intensity of the asymmetric stretch decrease with uh, the increase of the ion beam influence. And in the case of uh, the thinner thickness, the asymmetric stretch out of a phase become more visible. Uh, so uh, a collaborator of uh, this work performed uh, a simulation using dipole model, and uh, I will skip the details about the model. The general idea is that we can we can uh, s simulate the scatter fields, and the scatter field is a function of uh, the AFM tip parameters and the uh, parameters of the material. So uh, we can we can note that the general idea is that we, we will consider different. Uh, different uh, thickness of a silicon dioxide, and we can note the same behavior of uh, the simulated data and the experimental data. If uh, we, we, we decrease the thickness of uh, the silicon dioxide, the intensity of the asymmetric stretch decreases. And in the case with uh, the thinner thickness, the asymmetric stretch out of a phase become more visible. So we believe that the, the decrease in the asymmetric stretch in our experimental data is, is due to the physical etching of the ion beam. Now uh, we, we will consider a second effect of the radiation, the, 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 the oxygen vacancy defect due to the, to the ion beam. So in this case, we, we will consider in our model 
two layers, one layer of a silicon dioxide and a top layer of a composed by silicon dioxide and, uh, and uh, oxygen vacancy defects. And uh, each, each curve in this graph corresponds to a one kind of a vacancy defect. Now we can note that uh, if uh, we, we consider the vacancy defects, we have a new band in this region between 800 and uh, 1000. And if we look to the same thickness in our experimental data, we can note that we have here a band in the same region. So we believe that these bands correspond to the oxygen vacancy defect. Okay. Okay, now I will talk about, I will present a synchrotron infrared characterization, nanospectroscopic characterization for the nanostructure. So uh, the SYNCS is a kind of a tip enhanced technique and uh, we, can, we can probe information about, the, to about the, the, the topography and the spectroscope. So here I present a topography image and here a broadband image. In the broadband image, we can note that the, the signal of the nanostructure is different from the signal of the background. And we can measure this, the spectra of the nanostructure and the spectra of the background. So the nanostructures correspond to point one and the background point two. And here I present the spectra. So the spectra of the background is the red curve and the spectra of the nanostructure is the black curve. We can note that in the spectra of uh, the background, we can recognize the stretch modes of a silicon dioxide. But if we look to the spectra of uh, the nanostructure, we cannot recognize the stretch modes. So in the beginning, we change the stoichiometry from silicon, silicon dioxide to silicon suboxide. And now we separate the silicon suboxide and silicon and silicon dioxide. Again, if we look to the spectra of uh, the background, we can recognize a, a band in this region which corresponds to the signatures of the vacancy defects according to our model. So, uh, I, the conclusions of uh, this part, uh, I show the synthesis of uh, silicon nanostructures. Uh, with the ion beam radiation, we can induce a phase transition and, and separate the silicon suboxide and silicon dioxide and silicon, and we report the signatures of uh, oxygen vacancy defects. So this is the first part of my presentation, and now I would like to change to the second part of my presentation, and now I will talk about the electronic structure of hydroxyl adsorbed on silver surface. And uh, this work is a collaboration between Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Fritz Harbor Institute, and Brazilian Synchrotron Light Lab. Uh, so the adsorption of uh, water and the oxygen is, is one of the most studied adsorption cases. And uh, in this work, we are interested to study the, 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 the hydroxylation of a silver surface. So starting by a silver surface with uh, oxygen in a reconstruction two times one, we will study the hydroxylation of uh, the surface. The idea is that the oxygen adsorbed will react with uh, water, resulting in adsorbed hydroxyl. And we want to report the, the electronic structure of uh, hydroxyl. Uh, and th this, this, this problem can be applied in many other problems. Uh, so when, when you have an oxygen adsorbed on a silver surface, uh, this can help you to understand better the ethylene oxidation reaction, the interaction with a metal and the water can, can help us to understand the corrosion process. So we have uh, many applications of uh, this problem. The experimental procedure, for the ex experimental procedure, we use uh, the synchrotron radiation facility BES2, and uh, we will call those the oxygen and the water, and this proportional, and, uh, and uh, with uh, these conditions of uh, pressure and temperature. And we will apply surface science techniques like a NAP, XPS, and uh, X-ray absorption. Uh, here I presented uh, one oxygen 1S spectra after exposing to after exposing the silver surface to oxygen in these conditions of a pressure and temperature. And after exposing the silver surface, we can note that a single peak appeared at the position 528.3 
electron volts and this by the energy it's a it's a very this it's a very well defined by the energy and that uh, corresponds to the oxygen reconstruction two times one now if we call those oxygen and the water we can note that a second peak appeared at this position and we attribute this second peak to the hydroxylation of uh, the surface so what's happening here uh, we can note that the, the intensity of the oxygen peak decreases and the intensity of the second peak increases. So the idea is that the oxygen, uh, the, the adsorbed oxygen, are consumed during the, the dissociative adsorption of a water, which will result in a adsorbed hydroxyl. Uh, we can think about the structure of uh, the surface, and in this sense, a collaborator of uh, this work performed uh, DFT simulations, and uh, here I presented a phase diagram of uh, surface Gibbs energy as a function of uh, oxygen chemical potential and temperature. Uh, we know that uh, a phase becomes stable than the, the clean surface if the, uh, if the, the, the surface Gibbs energy is negative. So in this range of a temperature or chemical potential, the oxygen reconstruction two times one, represented by the red color, minimizes the surface Gibbs energy. Here I present the structure of, a, this, of, a, of a, this surface, and this reconstruction corresponded to a chance, a silver surface with uh, silver atoms, which form a chance with uh, oxygen. So we have a chance of uh, silver oxygen, silver oxygen, and this, this chance running in a zero, zero, 001 direction. Now, uh, if I will change the range of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, te the temperature, uh, we have that the hydroxyl reconstruction one times two minimizes the surface Gibbs energy, and that this reconstruction corresponds to this picture. We have a, a, a change in the orientation of uh, the unit cell, and now we have a chance of hydroxyl which run in direction 110. And now, if I will know the structures that minimize the surface Gibbs energy, we can calculate the binding energy of uh, these reconstructions and compare the binding energy with our experimental data. So the, the simulated binding energy are, are correspond to these vertical lines and uh, show a good agreement with uh, our experimental data. Now I will present some results of uh, valence bands after exposing the silver surface to the oxygen. Uh, here I present the valence band of this case. The gray curve corresponds to silver surface with a desorbed oxygen, and the red curve corresponds to the difference spectrum relative to silver clean surface. We can note that there is a mixing between uh, the oxygen 2P and the silver 4D, and uh, that the, the, the adsorbed oxygen creates states inner the D band. We can uh, compare our experimental data with uh, our DFT simulations, the PPDOS, for this reconstruction, and uh, they show the same behavior. And uh, if uh, we look to the PDOS, we can, uh, we can uh, understand that uh, the silver D bands of the adatum silver. Uh, splitting the oxygen, the, the states of the oxygen and in bonding states and antibonding states. So we can recognize that this peak at six electron volts corresponds to the bond states and the other peak at three electron volts corresponds to the antibond states of uh, oxygen and the silver. Now I will present the same uh, results for the case of hydroxyl. So we will uh, expose this, the silver surface to oxygen and hydroxyl uh, in these conditions, in these conditions of uh, temperature and pressure. And uh, now we, can uh, we have the same idea. The gray curve corresponds to the silver surface with adsorbed oxygen and hydroxyl. And the blue curve corresponds to the different spectrum. Here, we, uh, we can note that the hydroxylation creates states below and above the silver D band. Again, we can compare our results with the simulated, uh, with the simulated PDOS for this re uh, reconstruction, hydroxyl one times two. And we can recognize that in this case, this peak at eight electron volts corresponded to bond states of hydroxyl with a silver. 
and these other peaks at a six and the three electron volts corresponding to bond and antibond states of uh, oxygen with a silver. Now I will present uh, the, the OK edge spectra. In this kind of a technique, we probe in the unoccupied states. And, uh, and uh, here I show the OK edge for the case of adsorbed oxygen and adsorbed hydroxyl. We did the measurements of uh, OK edge and XPS in the same instrument. So we can use the, the silver Fermi level as a common reference level and uh, change this axis from photon energy to uh, binding energy. So wh when you do this, we can note that the main edge appears at in the same in early position, but we have a, a, but the intensity of the main peak in the case of hydroxyl, the intensity of the peak decreases. So uh, the conclusion is that the hydroxylation did not change the energy of the unoccupied states, but the hydroxylation contributes to 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 fill the anti-bond states of the hydroxyl. And again, we can compare our experimental data, which correspond to the dots, with the simulated data, which correspond to the line, in the case of oxygen and hydroxyl, and they show a good agreement. Oh, yeah, there's the explanation here. Okay, so the conclusions of uh, the second part is that we're starting from a silver, uh, a silver surface with uh, oxygen in a reconstruction two times one, and uh, by this surface we stirred the hydroxylation of, uh, of uh, the silver surface, and we, we created a surface with a reconstruction hyd hydroxyl one times two by the dissociative desorption of uh, water. And uh, we, we hope that with uh, this work, we can shed the new light in the understanding of uh, the adsorbed hydroxyl in a metallic surface. And the conclusions of all my presentation, so the general idea is that I started with uh, the synthesis of uh, self-assembly structures by ion beam radiation, and then I finished talking about the adsorption of uh, hydroxyl. They are different topics which involve surface science, but uh, um, they are different topics, but all, but in both cases, we have a kind of order in the surface, but in different scales. So here we have an order in nano nanometric scales, and uh, here we have an order in atomic scale. So this is the message that I would like to, to pass. So thanks for your attention. No, no, it's fine. So thank you very much, Camila. So questions? You want to start, Joy? Yeah, please. So uh, for the first part, I'm, I'm really not into this uh, iron business, but um, can you maybe comment briefly what happens if you bombard the surface with the cesium ions? Will you also implant, impl uh, implant the ions? And it, it, the cesium interacts with oxygen, so you make cesium oxide, or what, what, what is going to happen there in the material? So here, depending on the energy of, uh, of the ion beam, uh, the cesium can be implanted. In this case, they are, uh, it's implanted in a, a six nanometers deep. So they are very, it's uh, very close to the surface, and in this case, it contributes to the spurring on the surface. But the, depending on the energy, the ion can, 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 cro can cross the sample, stay uh, in the middle of the sample, or in the, in the beginning of, uh, of the thickness. I think that is... Uh, yeah. We can have, but in this case, the cesium is very close to the surface. So we implant the cesium, but then another cesium ion can spur in the cesium, the first cesium. So if, I, if I, we, we use uh, more energy, we can, we, we can put the ion in the middle of uh, the sample, for example, in the, in the silicon substrate. But in our case, with a two, uh, two kV uh, energy, this, the ion is very, very close to the surface. And uh, they are sputtered together with uh, the silicon and uh, with uh, the oxygen atoms. One thing here, but that, that, that doesn't mean that uh, what you're seeing there at the end is still like silica, it's not cesium or what. So, yeah. well, how you know that? Because yeah, can you? Because of the infrared measurements. Uh, okay. 
here, uh, I measure the spectra of the nanostructure and the spectra of the, of the background. We can look for signatures of, a, of, a, of a silicates with a silicon and cesium, but we don't have this, this kind of a signature in this spectra. So in this case, we don't have a cesium. Maybe you can have one or two cesium in the middle of the situation, but they don't, they don't, uh, they don't react with the silicon forming another, another molecules, another compounds. Uh, concerning uh, also this f this area, um, when you identified the uh, extra band due to the oxygen vacancies, right around 900 uh, reciprocal or something around there, did you test that when you expose the surface to oxygen and heat it again, that it disappears? I mean the oxygen vacancies, right? I would expect that if you expose the film to oxygen afterwards and heat it up. These things go away. But when, what, but when, what is your identification um, scenario? How do you identify the identify as an oxygen vacancy? Okay. So in in this case, uh, we 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 use the, the the dipole model. So this is a, a simulated a simulation results. Okay, and we consider a model composed, a sample composed by two layers, a silicon dioxide layer and a layer composed by silicon dioxide and uh, vacancy defects, but it's, it's just a simulation. In our measurements, we, uh, we identify these bands in the, in the, same, f in the same thickness of the our that we use it in our model. So because of this, we attribute these bands to the signature of uh, the oxygen vacancy defects. Yeah, yeah, now we can, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question, I can do this now. Yeah, but can I add, add something? So that also would be the question like, uh, um, uh, I'm not so familiar like the, the instrumentation that's available there in the simpleton where you did this uh, work, but you can use also explore this technique right now to explore other oxides or even look for a quartz crystal surface or and so on, people are doing that, so I'm not sure if you can comment on that. I don't know if uh, the uh, if uh, the persons of uh, the line are using this kind of technique to probe uh, o oxide, but I think it's possible. It's just uh, do to grow an oxide and uh, and uh, try to to use this kind of technique. You have one more question? Yeah. Uh, so for the for the second part for the for the OH, I noticed that the um, OH uh, signal. Um, was way broader. It's like almost three electron or two and a half electron volts broad. Uh, so, if what do you think? Is it is it really uh, is it really one signal? Or sometimes you also have OH and and water. So, what is the conditions uh, under what conditions did you take this spectra? Is it room temperature or is it at this uh, at this elevated temperature? So, you think it's OH. Yeah, yeah, good. But if uh, if you uh, quantitatively convert it to, to OH, then the OH would also adopt the same structure as you show uh, on your peak, but it's uh, it's it's way broader. Uh, so if you it's much broader. So did you? We didn't do the quantity of hydroxyl in in this case, but uh, I I can do this. It's a, it's a it's a good question. Do you think that uh, the, the hydroxyl peak is broader than the oxygen? Then okay, okay. In this regard, this is you mean like the, the if the, the broadness is if it's so broad, you can like include more components and try to get the, the right. I see. But uh, that 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 temperature, maybe the residual water is not going to stay on stick on the surface for so long, right? So that would be, yeah, I see. Yeah. So the measurement will perform it at 10 minus four. So that was the uh, NAP experiment, N not so NAP, but uh, still like high pressure. So we have a, a question from Ed uh, here of in, in 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 the the, in the YouTube that is uh, about the FCIR spectra. 
if you did a comparison with, with the literature, so you, you identify at 900, so maybe a higher work in Fritz Haber can also serve as a comparison for the FTIR spectra, right, for the silica film. But uh, if you have some comparison, because you showed the calculations, but if you could correlate, please. Yeah. So in this case uh, here, I showed two results. Um, uh, the solid black line corresponds to my results, and the dot lines correspond, uh, uh, correspond to experimental results from Zhang, and uh, with uh, the, same, uh, the same thickness. So we have uh, uh, an agreement with uh, our, our silicon dioxide spectra, our infrared spectra, with uh, the spectra of uh, the Zhang. So we compare our results with results from the literature, and we have uh, a good agreement. For wait, okay. For the mm, that same measurement that you take, uh, the the one that he asked about, did you test it? Did you test it with only water on on the on the screen? Because uh, there is a report on platinum particles, and they take. Uh, it's the hyd hydrolyzation of carbon monoxide over platinum particles, and the the band for water is quite close to hydroxyl, so it might be like he said, but you can bypass this if you only put water instead of water and the oxygen, and you will have something quite like the other one, and then you just subtract it, so if you just put water on the, the screen, here. Because at this temperature, in nanoparticles of Platinum uh, water does still it, it it is still there, so it might be po it's not impossible. Just uh, what what he said what he said there is a paper that says otherwise. So then you want to comment on that? Please? Yeah, we check. Okay, so <laughs> we check the uh, some some kinds of uh, of a familiar con uh, contaminants of uh, the silver, so plat platinum, molybdenum, and the carbonates. And uh, because of this, we, we attribute this peak to the hydroxylation. But it's a good uh, information that you said about the platinum, and uh, I, I will check more uh, about, about the synthesis of maybe nanostructures of, uh, of a platinum in this, in this situation. Thanks. So now we are going to move on to the um, to the talk here of our colleague Braulio Arcanjo from the National Institute of Metrology. We are glad to have him here as well. So this is one of the, the, the reference in Rio and in Brazil in the electromicroscope nowadays. Uh, and he actually started his, um, um, his career in the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte. And there he was working, as far as I remember, but I checked here uh, recently again, so titanium oxide vacancies uh, using EFM uh, with Bernardo, right, at that time. And I was doing a lot of uh, atomic force microscope. But I swear he's got his uh, position in the National Institute of Metrology. He became a leader uh, 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 of, of, or has become a, a leader in the la last years, last 20 years, right? Right now, you're 20 years there, 2009. Twi 12 years, 12 years. Yeah, and then uh, he's working with electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. And I mean, anything that you are looking for in this business, you can also write him about. And then some of the topics that he's uh, engaged is instrumentation in, in, in tears, in, in, in tip enhanced um, um, uh, Raman spectroscopy, but also in 2D materials, defects in, in surface. So I guess he's going to bring us a bit of the plasmonic nano antennas for near field microscopy that's also related to the electron microscope work that he's used to conduct there. So 
Braulio, thank you for coming. Please take the microphone. Thank you, Fern thank you Fernando, for my water. Yeah, I forgot my water. <laughs> thank you, Fernando, for the, the for the invitation, and thank you all for your time here. So, I'll I'll show you a little bit about my research over here. So, I start uh, with uh, some advertisement about in metro. We work in nanotechnology, microscopy, and metrology. We do service for industry projects in funding funding agencies, projects in companies, shared multi-user labs. So I show a, a few results from now our our use the, our, our multi-user lab and metrological dissemination. So in Metro is the National Institute of Metrology. In Germany, it's more similar to BAM, but it do it also does some work uh, similar to PPD. So. Uh, Innovation service in for industry here, uh, I show like uh, how we use like field tomography. So we have a focus ion beam and we can do like a slicing view. Uh, it's a wet, wet welding. So uh, we can do this, this is the slice. You can see as you enter, we see those inclusions. It's ox oxygen inclusions. And then we can we build it and do a 3D tomography. So we can see nanoparticles in the range of uh, 10 to 100 nanometers here. Um, uh, I also show here some uh, um, double layer tubes. I mean, sometimes you need like a, a, um, a conventional steel outside and you need a, 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 like a, res a chemical resistant, uh, res resistant layer uh, inside of the tube. So here we can study this interface in the microscope as well. So we can study the crystallography of the materials and then we can do chemi chemical analysis as well. And also with tubes, here I have some examples from press out studs where uh, the, those tubes they used to, to, to last for like 20 years. Nowadays they are lasting, they are, they are failing f with one or two years and it's very expensive. And the things that happen over there might be at the nanoscale. So if you, if you pick up a sample and put it on transmission electron microscope, you see here you can see na nano, nano precipitate on the scale of 10 nanometers or less. If you use like a SEM, a, a scanning electron microscopy, to do these study, studies, you are going to see that it's, uh, I, I mean, you, you can't see those, those. you see it's uh, homogeneous in the electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy. Also, uh, here I brought an example where uh, we work with consumer safety. So it's like a cheap jewelry that uh, was coming from China. So it's like a, a, a it, it was full of cadmium. And we, we could found that, uh, I mean, we, we pick, up, pick up the one of this cheap jewelry and uh, just made a cross section. So here you have the, the, res the polymer where you put it. You have like a layer of copper and then you have like the zinc cadmium tetic alloy. So why they put it? Because it's very cheap, I mean, to, to, to melt it. So it's very cheap to build. But it's, uh, it's very contaminated with cadmium. Also, uh, I brought here an example where we work with uh, Phil Cruz and in Metro. In Phil Cruz is a place where they make uh, basins in, in Brazil. And here's a biological sample. So we see a cell contaminated with COVID. And then we see the breeze of a cell over here. So we can see here that those small particles are uh, COVID virus. And also we can look at the transmission electron microscope. So we, we have a much better vision of this COVID virus. You can see even the, the structures they have around it. Uh, here I brought some images. I mean, uh, high resolution STM. It's a probe correct uh, Titan we have over there, uh, scanning transmission electron microscope. So it's an image of uh, at a atomic resolution of uh, molybdenum and US 2 And it's just, just a gold nanoparticle because People like to study gold nanoparticles. I mean, they, they have beautiful pictures. And uh, here I start a little, show a little bit how we can use those microscopes to study surface science. So nowadays we are working with uh, our devices, our mobiles, uh, and they have like these, uh, they are transistors. The isolating material is on the, the range of one nanometer. So, I mean, they need some calibration, so we can do that calibration using, using the electron microscope. So here we have a, a sample where, sorry, uh, a sample where we have silicon. Uh, it's a crystalline silicon, and then we have a layer of silicon oxide, and then we have those high, high isolating material 
uh, as uh, half no oxide, for example. And here we have just a platinum protection that we do in the microscope to prepare this sample. Because when you put the, this sample, to, to bring a sample to uh, the electron microscope, you need to, to, to transmit an electron microscope, you, you need to have a very thin sample. So you need to prepare that. This is one thing that makes the, the things a little bit difficult. You need to bring those small samples over there. Uh, here is an example of a uh, of, uh, uh, work uh, we I've made with Fernando. So we have studied stu stu the structures of uh, uh, MN3041110. So he here we have a, a whole picture of the sample. Uh, we have the copper substrate, 111. And then we have the oxide film. And then we have like a silver capping. Because we need to take this sample out from the, from the uh, UHV and bring it to the PEM. So this is the, 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 the this, uh, capping layer. We, we, with this capping layer, we intended to protect, the, protect the, the oxide film. And then we can bring to the microscope and look at, because with STM, you can just see the surface. And here you see uh, the cross-section of your, your oxide film. So we can see the difference in the size, for example, of, of, of the, a few layers as you, grow or as you go up in the film. Also, you see the first layer here. You see it's a little different. And we can like recognize it, uh, uh, different uh, oxidation or different uh, si uh, MN sites. So it's uh, how we can use the PEM. I mean, you use uh, the fib lamella. You prepare it using a, a dual beam microscope. And then you can bring it to the PEM and see the film, cr a cross section of the film. Also, we have some research in graphene, and uh, we do devices, I mean, um, uh, um, OPV devices with uh, flexible substrate. We also study industrial graphene, and uh, we can do some pattern with it that I show, uh, that I show to you, how it helped us to build our, our uh, nano antennas. That's the main subject of this talk today. So here, I came to the, the main topic of this talk. So we have this technique, which we usually call, uh, is known or tells, is scanner near optical microscopy, or tip enhanced hum spectroscopy. And how it works? You have like a tip, like a AFM or a STM, and then you shine light over there, and then you have an enhancing of the field here uh, due to the, the surface enhanced uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, and then you will start to have a, a resolution around uh, the size of your tip. So I show how we uh, uh, build uh, those nano antennas and the results we uh, have been with that. We also build our new, our uh, it's a homemade machine where we have like many parts together. Uh, we have the spectrometer. We also have a APD, so you can do image uh, fast images or you can do a, a 3D data collection with the spectrometer. And uh, the, uh, uh, everything is connected by the tip. Here you see a, um, um, a tuning fork with the gold tip, with the nano antenna, with a nano antenna. But the problem is that if you have like the best machines, I mean, from many uh, different companies, if you have the, the best parts, the, bi the biggest problem uh, the biggest the biggest problem is the antenna itself. So you need to have a good antenna, a good nano antenna to uh, make this technique uh, useful. So here is how we 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 uh, developed this work. We have a, a, a ability to to change material at the small scale. Uh, we we needed to use the transmission electron microscope. I will show how we use that. It's a lot of work in microscopy to build those antennas because you need to understand what is happening over there. The grain size is a problem. The way uh, I mean, people used to to, do, to make those antennas like STM tips, but then the grain size is a big problem. Different from an STM tip where uh, you just uh, use the last atom of your, your of your tip. So that's how we uh, we build our our. Uh, ability to write really small. If you use like a, a commercial fib gallium, uh, you have like a, it's a, the symbol of a metro and it's about two micrometer in size. If you use like a neon, it's a different technique. It's not very commercial, but uh, but uh, you can 
you have like the, the helium ion microscope that works also with helium, you can go down to one micrometer. If you go to helium ion microscope, you can do a two, 200, two, 250 nanometers. So it's really, really small. I mean, much better than a, a gallium fib. That is a commercial one. Um, also, I need to introduce uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, which we have heard here today already. But uh, it's on a transmission electron microscope. So you have your sample over here. You have you, the bunch of lenses you have in, the, in your transmission electron microscopes. Microscope. Uh, you have a pumping aperture, and then you have your 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 hardware over here. It's uh, almost another microscope, but we have a magnetic prism over here where we can uh, select the energy we want. So again, we can do images like uh, 2D images, or we can do spec uh, spectroscopy and build 3D. Uh, data. Uh, if we, we look at the uh, use spectra, we have here the zero, zero loss peak, where we have just the electrons that it's not scattering by your sample. Um, on this range here, near the zero loss, we have the what we call plasmas, and those are the very important uh, 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 thing to to um, to tip enhanced hum spectroscopy to enhance the signal of your tip. Uh, also, you can you have those signals where you can uh, I, mean, I mean it's I mean it's very similar to the the, the signal the co the core loss you have in a, in a synchrotron machine. So, our first try was like uh, to to confine the electrons using the FIB. So we have this gold tip. Okay, so we do this confinement over here. It's most uh, s the electrons behave here behave behave here like uh, I would say like. Um, uh, um, air inside a tube. So if you combine the movement, so you can choose some frequencies. So that's how we, uh, I think it's a little bit slow. Or maybe, maybe mm, I'm not sure. It <laughs> I think it's, it's not working anymore. Uh, maybe it's the battery. <laughs> Oh, and maybe it's Windows. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, no mixer. Let's try it again. <laughs> Let's see. No videos today, so uh, at least can can we show the slide? Yeah, we can show the slide, but I don't know what happened over here. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> So, uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> é, mas não tem problema. É, mas não tem problema não. É, não exatamente esse. Não era esse. Não era esse. É, abre a página só e tá bom. Não, depois você muda para apresentação. Só põe ela e o próximo. Mais embaixo. 
Opa, parou. Aí. É a Ria. Não foi no modo que ele disse que foi, não. É o próximo slide. It's ok. This size is ok. It's big enough. So, here... Oh. Ah, great. Uh, here you can see, like, a use spectrum. Uh, taking a bit the, the very tip of the of the, the nano antenna. In blue, you see before we do this uh, this groove, and in, in orange or red, I don't know. <laughs> I, in orange, you can see here uh, after doing this groove. So we have like a peak plasma. We we now have a peak plasma at the energy, and this energy depends on the size of uh, of, uh, of your antenna. Now um, I um, here. Uh, uh, we, you can see the use map. We can do 2D use maps. Uh, so you just uh, change the energy, and you have different maps. Uh, but this video is the problem, I think, of the presentation, so I'm not going to play that. But here we can show, uh, at these times, it, it was about 2015, so it's uh, about like seven, eight years ago. We see, like, a, if we do a confocal RAM spectros uh, image, we see this, it's an image of graphene, and using the chip we can, uh, we could have like a better resolution. But uh, still, uh, the resolution is about like 40 nanometers, which is much better than the, the, the wavelength of the laser we are using, and the signal increase w was about like five times, so it's, ver it's still very small. But uh, it's, we could control it very well, very well, I mean. And it's uh, also time, uh, time consuming, because you need to pick up tip by tip and take it to the, your FIB and make this cut. Uh, we also studied uh, with like a try the different uh, shapes of this groove, like using the helium ion beam. We did the uh, use tomography, did 3D reconstruction, and uh, um, also simulation using this uh, software, uh, this code, which is a metal nanoparticle uh, boundary element method, where, where it solves the Maxwell equations on, on the on the on the on the boundaries of these elements he over here. So you can simulate these plasmons, and then you can you can. Uh, uh, calculate your pl uh, the size you need in, in different uh, with chips with different shape. Uh, but uh, maybe we should go go back to presentation mode. But then uh, we start to use another way. I mean to to do microfabrication. So we call it template stripped pyramids. Uh, so we do some um, uh, microfabrication over here, we do some corrosion, and then we put our, our, our gold layer, and then we pick uh, it's a, a few images of uh, our process. You see here the pyramid, and then we... Uh, oh. yeah, I think it, it's not working. It's uh, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not actually the videos. Oh, so it's a, a reproducible way to to make uh, tips. We can do hundred of them, but the problem is that uh, it's the electron is not confined. It's confined, I mean, on a few micros range. So we don't have a, a plasma energy on the laser we wanted to use. Then we created a, a very special method. That's the next slide. <laughs> Where we have a nano pyramid on top of the pyramid, of the micro pyramid. And then we start to have plasmas again. <laughs> Let me show it to you. Ah. That's okay, the size is okay. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, that's okay. So we have here the micro pyramid, and then we do this lithography process again, and then we have like a nano pyramid on top of the micro pyramid. And then we start to have like the plasmonic modes again. We can see it using the electron energy law spectroscopy. Uh, so it's the evolution of our methodology. We start in seven years, we build a, a new kind of tip. 
that uh, changed the game in, in TERS technology. I mean, th this is the most difficult thing to, to build, the tips, because it's very, very small. On the it's in the range of 100 nanometers, but now we can microfabricate them, right? So we, we can change the size. Nowadays, we are changing from gold to, to silver to work with uh, lasers, because uh, the, go the, uh, the tip, the nano antennas in, uh, made of gold, they are good for the red laser at maximum. Uh, green laser at maximum. So you, if you um, work, work with silver, you can go to, to um, ultraviolet. Uh, just a few pictures where we are tuning uh, the tips, uh, use to uh, the images and simulation we did uh, calculating the, the plasma modes. Um, so here is just a beautiful picture, uh, a few images showing our uh, our our um, our microfabrication process. We have like a, a few patents in Brazil, United States, China, and Europe. And here is just uh, the sim uh, sorry the sim the symbol of a metro with the conventional uh, Raman. Uh, it's the best image you have. After using this chip enhanced ham spectroscopy, you can resolve resolve it to a 10 nanometer resolution. So you have an optical signal, and it's uh, very similar to AFM image. So that's how we use it to to we need it to we need like the ability to pattern very small with the ion beams with microfabrications. We need the electroenergy loss spectroscopy, and we need an needed a lot of microscopy to build those nano antennas. So here's just a, uh, another advertisement. So we have our, our main electron microscope. We have a probe corrective titan, uh, dual beam, helium nano lab, and this uh, helium ion microscope, which pattern very small. So if you have interest in, in use our multi-use facility, you can go here, you find, you find a way to get ASAC. Uh, also, uh, now I came to the conclusion, so I showed like a, uh, my cross my apply to nanotechnology, showed a uh, few services we do to, to safe in consumer safety and for industries. Also showed uh, nano pictures of nano device using graphene or um, uh, hafnium oxide isolators. Uh, the main topic of this presentation, nano antennas and instrumentations for nano optics. Uh, heal nano pattern in electron microscopy user facility. So, thank you very much for your time. So, thank you very much, Braulio. Very interesting talk. So, um, I'm sorry about the, the computer here, so, so we have to solve this. So, let's start for, for with questions. So, uh, you want to start, Jorge, please? Um, so, um, I guess when you, when you design these uh, antennas, uh, you could probably also simulate what would be the best shape that you could possibly um, build and uh, for the highest uh, intensity. So what would be the ideal um, geometry if you could build it? Thanks for the question. Yeah, actually we did a lot of simulations to build, uh, uh, to, to, to know, the, to know the, 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 the frequency of, 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 the, of the, the plasmons. And then we compare it with use electron energy spectroscopy. But still when we bring it to the <laughs> chip enhanced uh, microscope, it's still challenging. You know, there are not the things that uh, it's very important for your, for, for, uh, for the, the enhancement of the signal. I mean, sometimes you have like uh, the, the water, it's not in vacuum, so you have the water contamination, so it changes a little bit. Also, Ah, okay, okay, okay. When we have those mi microfabrication process, you you can you can make it sharper because I mean you are bounded by si si silicon corrosion. But using those uh, uh, um, etched chips, you can change the angle. I mean, we did a lot of simulation. I mean, if the chip is very is is uh, it's not very sharp, then we go very fast to infrared. I mean, but if the chip is very sharp, then we go to higher energy. But then you are b we are bounded by the, the, the plasma energy in gold because we cannot go higher than green. So there are many, many, many things that, uh, uh, that matters for the enhancement process. I mean, we are still working on that. I mean, if you can um, couple with the laser, I mean, 
that's why we could achieve with this research. It's a, it's a, it's a very important result for the technique. It's much better nowadays than it was before. I mean, if you think the grain size of the film, the grain size of the tip, everything uh, uh, changes your enhancement, and it's, uh, you can't predict that by the simulation. <laughs> because, I mean, you don't, you don't use grains in the simulation. You just solve Maxwell equations on the, on the, bon on the boundaries of the element. So there are many, many things when you go to the experimental, actually. So, so may, may I ask something like in this direction? Because also like my rationale would be why you come up with a pyramid with that shape on top of the other one. So it's, this is not only try and error because otherwise I would try and error something that's easier to do, right? You have all those angles there. So that's also came from the simulation. Why you come up with this shape or is this something that inspired you from some other work before? Uh, the the micro micro pyramid it's from a work before they used to do that and try to use that for 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 tip enhanced home spectroscopy, but it has no confining confinement. The confinement we start to do the confinement in the easiest way. I mean it's very expensive, it's time consuming, but the easiest way is to use a fib to make this confinement for the electrons. Then you can tune your plasma to uh, uh, the energy you want. Uh, so we we we. Ma ma uh, we put together the two ideas. So you have the pyramid and you have the confinement. So we made the nano pyramid on top of the micro pyramid. That's the point. So we, p we needed to put the two ideas together. The confinement and the microfabrication that is, is uh, the microfabrication for pyramid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At, uh, at, at the end of the day, everything is silicon based and then it's covered with the material you want. That's it? Yeah, the, uh, I, got, I got it. At the end, uh, we have like um, uh, we have a polymer to to f pick it up from the substrate, so it's a polymer. Like uh, you, we, we can use. Any, I mean, we have tested many different kinds of polymer, but uh, nowadays we use a UV period polymer. So you put it over there. You use like um, I think it's a tungsten wire w with this polymer, and you put it over there, and we, we cure it using UV, and then we pick it up. Right, so yeah, so more questions. Yeah, so I, I, I still am wondering about the, the uh, can you go back a, a couple of slides about the, the resolution? So people want say, uh, say that the resolution is the, it's when you're able to resolve something, right? So uh, that is close to each other. Maybe, I mean, like in the terrace community, many people say, I'm seeing a nanotube, but uh, are you distinguish one nanotube by the side of the other one? This would be really the resolution. Here you said that the resolution, it is better than before. Can you comment on that? So uh, we are seeing the structure that was before 250 nanometer size, right? But uh, that's not your resolution. Your re yeah. Um, this is the, the, the symbol actually made, uh, made um, uh, with the gallium fib because the, that one with 250 nanometer we cannot resolve with tears. We need to to go better. I mean, we can write even better than we can see with light. We need the AFM or the helium ion beam to see that 250. So it's the one, the two micrometer size in metro symbol, and uh, two, uh, 10 nanometer is the size of this is the 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 the, uh, the size of this line over here. So that's what we call the resolution. The smallest, I mean, uh, detail we can see. Okay, so it's, I mean, it must be about like five nanometers or a little less, this, uh, because how we build that, it's a graphene sheet, and then we, we uh, make defect with the, 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 the ions, the ions, like focused ion beam, and then we make this, this, this symbol, and then we use uh, Roma spectra, the defect band of Roma spectra to collect this image. That's it. And the smallest feature we have in this image has about 10 nanometers. That is very similar to AFM, environmental AFM. So if we don't have more questions, I'm going to do still one more. Like uh, the one about the pyramid, I mean, you said that even water is important. Okay, plasmons depend on the medium, right? So uh, this, uh, the, the book of uh, Kreibisch, right? So they are describing all the uh, plasma confinement in nanoparticles. So here you see, like, can you comment on this? Or you can you do, you said it's uh, pretty much affected by the environment because water. So, but that would be because your tip 
the grades or it's because this kind of the medium uh, displacement of the, the, the resonance? Uh, actually, we have both effects. The, the, the change in the resonance is not very, very difficult. You just change the size of the pyramid, the nanopyramid, so you can still tune it to the laser. Usually, I think we make it a little bigger. But uh, the problem with contamination is that uh, your chip may, uh, because when we are working in this kind of AFM that is uh, based on, on a tuning fork, it's a non-contact mode. So if you have the contamination layer of water, maybe uh, you your chip uh, um, park too far from your sample, from the surface of your sample. And then you need to be very near your sample, like in the range of one to five nanometer non-contact. So yeah, th th this is one thing that sometimes it's difficult to do. And also sometimes we have a, contamina a carbon contaminated layer that we see in like uh, you from surface science, you see on XPS, you always need to hit your sample or clean it to remove carbon. We have carbon over there, so we see amorphous carbon everywhere because it's on the tip. Nowadays, it's the biggest problem, actually. We see ca amorphous carbon everywhere. All right, if we don't have more questions, so let's think the, the probably again our speaker. Thank you. So uh, I think now we have time for the coffee break, right? And when we're back, uh, Jorg and Victor uh, is going to give their talk. So I would like also to thank the, the organized, uh, organizer committee, because actually they did all the job. So Guilherme, uh, who else? Like Roberto, Igor, uh, Ruben was doing. So my whole group that was supporting the organization, and then mostly these people, right? That's Thank them. So we are back here at 3.30 or what? I have to see the program. Yeah, but I don't have the program here. Ah, here, great. No, no, at 4. At 4 we are back. So bye. See you at 4 p.m. See you later. Alô, alô, som, som. <risos> alô, som. Acho que tá tudo certo.
So, yeah. So, thank you everyone to stay for the, the next session, the last one. Hope you enjoy the, the coffee break. Um, we are going to have now, first, uh, let me make an announcement. So, it's, uh, some of you that are not familiar with some of the, te the techniques that we are discussing here, we have some of these examples here in the lab, in the CVPF. And if you are interested, just look for Caio, that's not here right now, or Guilherme, that's over there, that they can show our lab here, our surface science lab, and then maybe like uh, illustrate, like uh, clearly uh, give you examples in real life of these pictures that you see here about this uh, FTR and XPS machines, right? So you are welcome. Uh, Guilherme is that guy over there, okay? Yeah, good. So. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jorg Libuda to come uh, to Rio, to, to Brazil, um, uh, to visit us. And uh, Jorg actually started his uh, work um, as a student of chemistry in Bochum University, uh, where he received his diploma in 1993, and then later on in 1996, the doctorate degree. Later on, he worked uh, um, as a group lead in the Fritz Haber Institute, if I'm not mistaken, with Heilfreund work on this um, um, FTIR applied um, um, implementing new HB vessels, so explore new possibility for this kind of a spectroscopy. And um, later on, he was in a postdoc for a couple, uh, uh, um, from 1998 and 1999 in the principal, uh, in, in Princeton University, and then moved around a little bit, but since 2005, he started his uh, professor uh, of chemistry, physical chemistry, here in the Erlanger um, Nuremberg University. The official name is Friedrich Alexander uh, University. And I'm very happy to have you here and uh, to learn about uh, from surface science to electrified solid interface. So please. Uh, Fernando, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and I'm really grateful for the uh, invitation and uh, it's really great that you organized this this um, workshop here uh, so i really appreciate so yeah um and also the the setting is uh, great so um i can uh, pick up on um what um Hayo presented in his presentation and and go on from that um so what we're doing uh in my group is uh, we're trying to start from a surface science perspective where we have really well defined interfaces um, knowing what their structure is and what their composition is uh, where the atoms are and then uh, what we try is we try to bring these systems um, into some sort of working environment um, which is very often um, liquid uh, environment electrochemical environment uh, photo electrochemical environment uh, and in this way try to combine the advantages of um, maybe side which hand is the one um, we uh, uh, try to combine the advantages of uh, surface science and uh, yeah in situ uh, spectroscopies so um, yeah uh, we're doing a lot of say joint projects uh, with 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 engineering groups, with applied material science group uh, in various fields, uh, wherever interfaces play a role. Um, catalysis, electronic material synthesis, electrocatalysis, photocatalysis, and so on. Um, and um, the idea is, is, is uh, always pretty much the same. So we try to make uh, model systems where we uh, know what their structure is, um, and uh, try to use this knowledge to better understand the chemistry that is going on uh, in these, let's say, real life processes. Uh, so I have uh, put that on a, on a, um, on a, in a, in this into the scheme here. So we're trying to make an interface. Uh, yeah, for instance, this type of hybrid interface here with um, uh, well-defined, uh, characterize it with all the technologies that we have and then bring it, for instance, into a liquid to see what it does when we apply uh, potential or we shine light on it uh, or do some uh, sort of uh, yeah, real-life operation with these systems. And you can, appro you, can you, you can use this approach for various fields and I picked um, four examples here from different fields, one from the field of uh, Catalysis, where you often have metal particles and oxides. So, how can you use these systems in electrocatalysis? Um, 
I, uh, we, we work a lot on the modification of catalysts by ionic species, so for instance by ionic liquids. I'll explain later on how that works. Um, there's, there's a lot of work on functional uh, materials, functional molecular films uh, at ox oxide interfaces. Again, we use the same approach. And in the end, I will show a little bit uh, um, some, some work, some new work on um, photo um, electrochemistry. So let's start uh, with this um, topic of metal particles and oxides. And um, yeah, what is the background? The background is that you can use these systems, for instance, in, um, in electrocatalysts, in fuel cells. So this is an example of such a mixed metal oxide electrocatalyst. So this is for fuel cell that uh, contains platinum, some oxide, serum oxide uh, compound, uh, uh, component, and uh, some carbon nanostructures. And this is actually a very good uh, fuel cell catalyst. So it's very, um, surf uh, very uh, noble metal um, efficient. Uh, of course, you would like to understand yeah, how these systems work and what is the origin of the stability. So do we try to make model systems um, with a surface science approach, which means that you make an interface where you know, hopefully, where the atoms are. Uh, and we've been look looking a lot at uh, cobalt oxide interfaces. Um, and uh, this is an example here of two cobalt oxide uh, surfaces that you can make. Um, and they're make made on the same substrate. Yeah, and the, the big advantage here uh, is that you really know where the atoms are. No? So for instance, CO3 or 4111 is terminated by cobalt ions in, uh, and, and, uh, in, uh, uh, and, and oxygen ions and uh, this as well, but the coordination environment is different. Yeah, and uh, these are not systems that, that we have developed. It's actually from our physics department at uh, our university, um, Faust Heinz and uh, Lutz Hammer and Alexander Schneider now uh, put a lot of uh, effort into the preparation and characterization of this system. I'm showing uh, these uh, two examples here because uh, it illustrates quite nicely why it's so important to have surface science um, information. Because, I mean, these uh, two surfaces, they are terminated by the same ions. So you could expect that maybe they have the same surface chemistry, but this is not the case. Uh, so if you absorb um, infrared, uh, if, you, if you absorb water on this surface and do infrared spectroscopy, so we do a lot of infrared spectroscopy here. Uh, this is the setup. Uh, we use the sample, look at the infrared spectra, and then expose to uh, gases. If you do that with these two surfaces, they behave totally, completely differently. Yeah? So there's, there's, they have nothing in common, so to speak. Um, on the CO3 or 4 surface, you absorb water and you get very complex infrared spectra, which basically tell you that there's dissociation of, um, of water, and then there are OH water structures being formed. So it's an extremely reactive surface. Whereas the COO, 100 surface, is totally inert. Uh, there's only molecular absorption of water, and at, um, yeah, um, at uh, slightly above 200 Kelvin, all the water dissolves, and there's nothing left on the surface, so it's totally dead. Uh, and the, the, the termination is, uh, th they're the same ions on the surface. Okay, so um, uh, you can try to understand what is going on on these surfaces. And one way of doing that is by using infrared spectroscopy and combining with density functional theory. So this is an example here uh, with the cooperation with Philip Sauté from the UCLA. And tr we're trying to identify the absorption motifs of the water and the age on these surfaces. And the way you do that is you measure the infrared spectra, you do isotopic labeling experiment, and then you compare it to uh, the calculated spectra. And you hope to be able to identify some of the structures. And I'm not going to discuss all the structures that you find. I will just show you this little thingy here that we believe uh, we were able to identify. So this is what we call a half-solvated cobalt 2-plus uh, uh, surface ion. Uh, this is a cobalt ion, and it's coordinated by three oxygens from the lattice and by three waters. Yeah? So it's the species that is at the interface between the oxide le uh, lattice and, and the, the water, yeah? but in UHV, of course. So next thing would be uh, to use these systems and then bring them into um, life, into the working environment, which would be the liquid, right? So how do you do that? 
Uh, we set up this uh, system here, so which is a combination of the UHV system and the transfer system uh, to for the preparation. So you prepare the sample here in the ultra vacuum. Um, and then uh, you move the sample down here. Uh, the sample is, uh, yeah, the, the UHV part is decoupled from um, the high pressure part here. This is a glass cell with ultra pure water or an electrolyte or whatsoever you put want to put here. And then uh, the sample um, is, uh, is brought down here. It's detached from the sample holder, from the UHV sample holder. Uh, it drops into the water. It is uh, typically protected by the water. And then uh, in, this, uh, in this form, you can take it out and uh, put it into, uh, do for instance, some electrochemistry experiments uh, with this. Uh, so this is how we do this. Now, um, let me show you maybe a few experiments. So this is uh, some experiments that we did with cobalt oxide films that we prepared on gold. You know, so in gold, you can make these cobalt oxide islands very nice. Uh, uh, so this is, um, has been uh, pioneered by Jeppe Lauritsen uh, from Aus. And um, you can make this bilayer and this double layer islands in UHV, and now you can test uh, whether they are stable or not in the electrolyte. Yeah, and we do that by uh, in situ uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. So here in this method, you use a scanning tunneling microscope, uh, so a tip, uh, platinum iridium or tungsten tip, and then you isolate it uh, uh, with, the, with the coating. Uh, with this setup, you can really do this experiment in the electrochemical um, cell. And um, yeah, uh, let me just show you some pictures so you can follow um, the cycle in the cyclic voltammogram. You can follow uh, the points where you reduce the cobalt to cobalt two plus and metallic cobalt, and then at the same time follow the stability of this island. So it's a, of course it's not like UHV SDM, yeah, but I can still see the islands here, the, the bilayer and double lay bilayer island, and uh, change the potential and see if they're stable or not. And what you're seeing here is that then at some potential they become mobile, they really move over the surface, change their structure, and then finally uh, you can follow them uh, dissolving uh, on the surface. Uh, so you can, uh, you can determine under what conditions these systems are stable or not. So once you have done that, of course, you can, uh, you can make the system, ensure that they're stable, and then uh, try to understand how they behave. And um, yeah, when it comes to these metal particles that you could put on the oxide, um, it one important question is always electronic structure. Uh, so can you follow the electronic structure? Is it modified by the oxide support? And um, uh, is there an effect on the reactivity and on the stability? So we made uh, cobalt oxide films and uh, these uh, particles of different size, larger and smaller ones, and then uh, we looked at photoelectron spectroscopy. Yes, There's a lot of data. I just uh, uh, let me just highlight here one important thing. So what you can see is, if you make these very small islands, what you see is that you basically have oxi yeah, partially oxidized platinum uh, at the surface, and uh, we attributed uh, this to 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 an interaction with this with this cobalt oxide support. No? So we put this metal on the oxide support. The metal atoms that are really on the oxide, they have a electronic structure that is different. Um, okay, so this is a dry vacuum experiment. Now again, you want to do this in the electrolyte, but how do you do this? No? So with, with um, a photoelectron spectroscopy, it's not that easy. There's one more easy experiment that you can do, which you can see here. This is so-called immersion, uh, immersion XPS experiment, which is basically uh, describing the situation that you, ha that you have an electrochemical cell that is attached to the ultra vacuum system. So this is a cell that we set up here, a setup that we built at the synchrotron in Trieste in Italy. And uh, you can transfer the sample um, and you can do electrochemical experiments and then do the analysis afterwards. Yeah, so the setup for the experts uh, is shown here. So we have a single crystal make contact to the electrolyte, to electrochemistry, and then wash the sample and bring it to, um, uh, to the uh, uh, measurement chamber. Uh, and there's a little movie showing how it works. So this is the single crystal. We make contact to electrolyte, to electrochemistry. Then we break the contact. Uh, we approach with our sample shower 
kind of wash the sample uh, for a while, and whenever you believe that it's clean, then you uh, bring the sample to the measurement chamber and uh, try to uh, analyze it. And um, well, this is a quite yeah, it's the ex situ experiment, but it it is working. So you can follow the oxidation of the platinum particles. So these are platinum particles, platinum zero, and we can change the potential. And then at the expected potential, you see that the surface of the particles is oxidized. You can really follow the oxidation and reduction, in spite of the fact that it's it's not really in situ experiment. Yeah. For the small particles, uh, you don't see this oxidation now huh? because they are always oxidized. The oxidation state is stabilized by the by the support. Now, um, of course, uh, it would be nicer to do a in situ electrochemical exp experiment. Yeah, and the question is how to do that. So, there is uh, if you if you're a little bit familiar with the field, there's this uh, so-called dip and pull method, and the idea here is that you dip a crystal into an uh, electrolyte. And then you try to stabilize a thin film of electrolyte on the sample that is so thin that you can do photoelectron spectroscopy through this film. Yeah, it must be very thin, yeah, just a few nanometers. Yeah, but you can do it. But there's one drawback with this experiment. Yeah, so you have to really dip this large crystal into the liquid, pull it out, and for that normal setup, you need a huge crystal. You need single crystals that. That would be would have to be something like five centimeters long. Yeah, so normally you don't have that. Um, so uh, we um, we built a new device here that 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 is compatible with all the uh, surface science uh, boundary conditions that we have with small crystals. So this is just a little capillary um, that is uh, that is making this contact to this film, and we can be very close to the analyzer. And this together with the team from the Helmholtz Center in Berlin with David Starr and Marco Ferraro there, and. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is compatible uh, with this uh, uh, with this uh, normal single crystals, and it's just a plug-in device that you can add to a high-pressure XPS. Yeah, so probably even to yours uh, that you have here in the lab, and uh, do in situ uh, electrochemistry with it. Um, we just did the first test experiment, so again, there's a lot of data. Uh, there's only one important message: is uh, we we looked at metal particles and oxides, and we um, we put the electrolyte on top and changed the potential. And the important message here is: if you change the potential, we saw a shift in uh, in this uh, electrolyte uh, signal in the signals from the electrolyte, and that means that this uh, the Helmholtz layer on top of the crystal is alive uh, so you can really change the potential in this thin um, in this thin absorbed layer uh, so it, pr it it works uh, so far okay um, so one uh, one idea here about the um, about this oxide is that the oxide may may help you to stabilize um, the small metal particles yeah would um, th that's one of the ideas uh, so you could Build catalyst or design catalyst that have a lower noble metal uh, loading, uh, but of course uh, you have to test whether this is really the case. Do you really stabilize noble metals by these oxide matrices? And um, uh, this you can find out with the experiment that you can see here. This is a so-called scanning flow cell inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry experiment um, that's uh, done at the Helmholtz Institute in Erlangen in a group of Karl Meyerhofer. And it's basically a little flow cell. And then at the outlet of the flow cell, um, you can measure the corrosion rate. You know, so how fast is the dissolution uh, here? And this is an awfully sensitive experiment. You can detect dissolution rates of now one mono layer in several hours. Yeah, so this is this is really enormously uh, sensitive. Ah, and we tested uh, the stability of these uh, systems. And uh, I just want to highlight here one thing. Uh, so we looked at these very small platinum nanoparticles on the cobalt oxide. What you're seeing here is indeed that the dissolution of the platinum nano nanoparticles is suppressed. You have very little dissolution of platinum. Uh, but you do have some dissolution of the cobalt. Yeah? And the idea behind that, or we, we believe the idea here is that um, the, there's some platinum incorporated into the cobalt oxide, and then the cobalt comes out and uh, dissolves. Yeah? And um, you anchor, so to speak, the noble metal in this oxide matrix. 
Okay, so um, now the uh, second thing that I would just um, introduce uh, briefly is a, a very active field of research at the moment at our university is um, the modification of catalysts by so-called ionic liquids. Yeah, and here I just want to highlight um, uh, this application. So uh, this is uh, this concept is called uh, solid catalyst with ionic liquid layer. So you basically take a conventional commercial catalyst and impregnate it, it impregnate it with the ionic liquid. Uh, and this is quite a quite a new concept. The idea is uh, to make catalysts that are more selective. Uh, it's quite new. It's just something like 15 years old. Um, and very surprisingly, uh, there's a there's already a um, application at industrial scale. And with industrial scale, I mean there's uh, 150 tons of this catalyst um, in a uh, in a hydrogenation plant, um, and the catalyst is sold by Clarion. No? So it's very rare, actually, that you have new catalysts um, in industry at that scale. So that tells you that this concept is extremely uh, successful. Uh, the question is how it works. Yeah. So in principle, it's very simple. Now so you have this ionic liquid, which is a low melting point salt, um, and it's a it's a coating on the catalyst. Yeah. And for some reason, the catalyst uh, gets more selective. Um, by this coating. And if you look into the literature, there are thousands of ideas how this coating could make the catalyst more selective. So some people say the solubility uh, plays a role. Some people say um, there are ligand effects at the interface. There are some people say there are blocking effects uh, at the interface. So it's um, uh, there's a lot of speculation, but apparently yeah, surface science uh, ideally should be able to help uh, understanding how these concepts work. Now, again, uh, we're trying to do infrared spectroscopy uh, to understand these interactions at the interface. Um, um, this this works nicely, actually, in UHV because these um, so-called ionic liquids these are yeah large, let's say, organic inorganic salts. Now so this is an example here um, that are liquid at room temperature or at relatively low temperature, often at, at room temperature. These uh, ionic liquids, they have a very low vapor pressure, so you can really put them in ultra vacuum and they stay there uh, as liquid. This is, uh, this is nice. Uh, and you can, uh, you can make a single crystal and put them there and then look with infrared spectroscopy uh, and try to understand what is the interaction with the surface. How do these mm, ions assemble at the surface? What is their job in the catalyst? And strategically, st strategically um, again, um, the best uh, thing to do is to combine the experimental data with um, simulations, um, with theoretical simulations. So these are density functional theory calculations and simulations of the spectra for different adsorption motifs um, on the surface. So it's work from the group of Andreas Görling, and we compare these simulated spectra to our experimental spectra and try to find out what are the adsorption motifs um, at the interface. Uh, I will not go through all the details because I just want to show um, the strategy, basically. So what you get out in the end is um, you get out an understanding what is the orientation, how the does the ion interact with the surface and what is the orientation of the ion at the surface. Uh, so for, for instance, you find that at at low coverages, the ions lie flat on the surface and, and they have a large footprint. And then it, if it gets crowded, they start to stand up and the adsorption motive changes. No? So it's, uh, you can get quite a detailed insight into uh, the behavior. So one extremely new concept is um, the, um, the use of these ionic liquids as modifiers in electrocatalysis. So the question is, would it be possible to use an electro um, an ion liquid to make an electrocatalyst more selective. Uh, so this is uh, this is the idea. Um, yeah. Uh, so we tested that, and uh, we had uh, this is our test reaction here. So this is uh, the butan diol. Yeah, and this is a molecule that you can oxidize selectively to this intermediate, that is the acetoin, and finally to this uh, species here, that is the diacetyl. 
Uh, and the catalyst is something very simple, platinum 111. And we use this ionic liquid as a modifier. And the question is, can we control the selectivity? And why, if we can? And again, uh, we are big fans of infrared spectroscopy, as I explained. Uh, but this time, we do the infrared spectroscopy made not in ultra vacuum, but we do it in an electrochemical cell. So this is the setup here. You use the same type of well-defined sample, reflect the infrared light, and look at the surface and you can understand what is going on at the surface and in the in the solution so what is going on uh, we, uh, we we use this ionic liquid and change the electrode potential and look at the spectra and then you see some bands that are disappearing and some bands that are appearing uh, and um, we can assign the bands and what you basically see is um, that as a function of the potential, not too surprising, if you go to more positive um, potential, there's preferential absorption of the OTF ions, um, N, uh, of the N ions at the surface, uh, and the absorption of the cations. Yeah, not too surprising. If you go to positive potential, you would expect that the N ions are absorbent. But you can also determine the orientation of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the ions and really show that it's specific absorption here. And then, uh, in the next step, we can check whether there's an effect of these um, ions on the selectivity of this reaction. And this is uh, just accepted, actually, two weeks ago in Angewandte now. Um, uh, so what we can do is we can take the infrared spectra as a function of the potential. Again, complicated spectra, but the good thing is you, you only have to look at this little band here. Yeah, this little band is the band of the acetoin, which is the in intermediate. And here this acetoin is formed and then is reacting again to the final product. But when you add the ionic liquid, it is formed and then the reaction stops. Yeah. And uh, from this data, you can also quantitatively con um, uh, determine the conversion of the selectivity and uh, show that the, uh, uh, that the activity goes down, but the selectivity goes up. So very typical behavior for, the, um, for this type of uh, concept. So how does that work? Our idea is the following. You start um, with this molecule. In order to oxidize it, uh, you need OH groups at the surface. That's in, uh, in the electrocatalytic process, the active species. And, um, this is where the oxidation, uh, this is required for the oxidation. Then you have the intermediate. And then if there's no ionic liquid around, uh, you, you go even higher with the potential. You will form more OH groups. And then the second group is oxidized. Now, if there are there's uh, ionic liquid around, what we saw from the spectra is that there's specific absorption of the anion of the ionic liquid. And there's a suppression of the formation of OH. No? So now there's no OH left anymore. So um, the second oxidation step is suppressed. Uh, and that's why we believe um, uh, we get this effect on the selectivity. So uh, maybe one comment at that point. Uh, there's all there are also drawbacks uh, with this concept. So uh, often you find that the ionic liquid have a have a bad effect on the on the uh, on the stability of the system. So that has to be controlled. No? So um, this is an example here with another ionic liquid. Uh, we we show we we see with infrared spectroscopy that this these ions here, the so-called DCA, absorbs on the surface. And then if you look, there should be, oops. Uh, if you look at the corrosion behavior, if you cycle the potential here without the ionic liquid, with the ionic liquid, you really see there's a lot of dissolution hole formation uh, if the ionic liquid is there. there. So uh, the, the, the stability can be affected uh, badly. So it's, it's actually very important to combine um, this chemical information with structural information. Yeah? And at that point, uh, maybe I, uh, I would like to um, advertise or make an adver uh, advertisement uh, for a new experiment that we set up uh, here at another synchrotron at DESI in, in Hamburg in Germany. And this is a combined experiment that is uh, where you can at the same time 
analyze the structure and the surface chemistry of uh, such a single crystal electrode uh, in one uh, experiment. Now it combines, uh, experiment combines surface X-ray diffraction and infrared spectroscopy. Uh, the setup is here, now so you have the single crystal, you come in with the infrared beam, do a experiment in a reflection at the same time with the X-ray beam and do surface X-ray diffraction. Uh, and this is a new system that is available for um, for users now so everybody could apply can apply uh, um, uh, can up, uh, come up with a proposal to use this system it's going to be in operation next year and this is the first test experiment where uh, we recorded infrared spectra and surface x-ray diffraction at the same time um, without moving the sample uh, on the same experiment so uh, I have no idea I'm doing in time. Maybe I have to shorten it sometimes. So uh, uh, where's uh, ah there you? Okay, so then we have to uh, discuss what we do. Uh, so I I think I uh, maybe I skip. Uh, I want to show you something that I find personally super entertaining. Uh, so I um, uh, I show you the last uh, last topic. Five minutes, perfect. So um, in the last years, we were also trying to uh, do one more step and include photochemistry in these uh, in situ experiments. Yeah, and um, uh, our favorite photochemist chemical systems um, are things like this here. You know what this is? Uh, this is a photo switch. Yeah, this is an organic photo switch. This little molecule here is the so-called norbornadiene. Um, and you can it can you it absorbs a photon and then is converted to this green thing up here, uh, the which is the so-called quadricyclane. Uh, so it's a little photo switch, and it's a it's a quite impressive photo switch uh, because the energy difference is quite large. No? So if you go go from here to here, you store about 100 kilojoules per mole um, of solar energy. And this is a uh, this is an uh, energy density that is uh, that is practically the same as a lithium-ion battery. No? So it's a it's a solar energy storage system. The question is how do you how can you release the energy? How can you control the energy release? No? So uh, we looked at the catalytically triggered energy release. Uh, we looked at the electrochemically triggered energy release. We we, we showed that this is possible with really high um, selectivity. Um, we are at 99.8% now in the meantime. Um, we looked at surface science with these photo switches, and there's also a review recently. So if you're interested in the topic, I would recommend this, this uh, review in Jewel appeared last uh, end of last year. So again, uh, we like to do infrared spectroscopy with these photo switches, and uh, we combined that with um, photochemistry. No? So we put a UV light source into the UV in the into the ultra vacuum. Uh, it's a s very high power UV light source. Uh, with this, you can uh, do the photo switching and at the same time do infrared spectroscopy to follow the photo switches. And let me show you here one experiment. So this is a molecule synthesized by the group of Kaspar Mohpausen. And this is, uh, um, is one of my favorites uh, because it can do so many jobs at the same time. So this is the storage unit, the norbornadiene, that stores the energy. There's a little antenna for the UV light. No? So it's a push and pull groups that, that absorb, are responsible for absorption of the light. Uh, the CN group is perfect for our infrared spectroscopy because we can follow the switching uh, by just looking at the frequency here. And then the molec molecule has a little anchor group so we can assemble it on the surface. No? So it's a pretty smart thing here. Um, then we assemble it on the surface and we can do all kind of photochemistry with it, uh, measure the, yeah, so this is uh, infrared that shows the switching. We can follow this, uh, the, the, the back transformation. Uh, we can measure quantum efficiencies. We can measure activation barriers uh, for the back conversion and so on. So, um, question: How do you get how how do you get the energy out of this photo switch? Yeah, so you store the energy, but you want to get it out. Yeah? So you need a uh, you need a good catalyst for that. And um, yeah, recently there was work from uh, Rainer Herges group at the University of Kiel and other groups from Kiel. They showed that 
uh, actually gold is an extremely good catalyst for the, for the back transformation. So we wanted to test that in ultra vacuum. The Rainer Herges group, they synthesized this, uh, this molecule here. Uh, so it's a little platform with a photo switch. Uh, we put it on a gold surface and looked at um, look at the switching. Yeah, and uh, uh, just show you this here. Uh, you can indeed show that if you just have a monolayer, um, the gold catalyzes the back reaction very efficiently, so it swi switches back immediately. And as soon as you have the molecules in the second layer, um, they don't switch back. No? So uh, gold is a very very good catalyst, and now. Uh, of course, uh, finally, again, uh, can you do the same trick in the in the liquid environment? So we use our uh, in situ electrochemical infrared uh, spectroscopy set system, and we add another trick. No? So this would be the normal um, infrared uh, spectroscopy system with the uh, with the infrared beam, single crystal infrared beam uh, reflection here, and we add uh, UV photon source. No, and the infrared window is also transparent for u UV light. So you can um, do the photo switching and the electrochemically triggered back switching all in one uh, system without even moving the sample. Yeah? And this is, this is really cool because then you can really do tests over many, many cycles because you don't have to manipulate the sample. So um, uh, we, 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 we anchored, for instance, these molecules uh, at cobalt oxide, oops, uh, cobalt o uh, at cobalt oxide and could show that we can switch uh, the molecules at the surface, but I want to show you uh, just one experiment with with which I personally don't understand, so maybe somebody has an idea. No? So this is all my, um, uh, everybody can contribute to the discussion in the end, maybe with smart ideas. Um, so um, this is uh, this is gold. Um, this is our catalyst, gold one one one. This is the molecule that we want to switch. Uh, we shine light on it. Um, we switch the molecule to this energy rich state. No, so this is just the concentration. Then we we, we turn off. Uh, we turn off the light, and the molecule decays back. Yeah. So the switching works very uh, very very well. And um, in this setup, as I said, we can do it over many cycles. So we did the photoconversion and back uh, conversion over 1,000 cycles in an automated experiments and could show that the, uh, the rate constant for, for this catalytic back reversion is, is very, very stable. It decreases by less than 1.1% 1 per, 1 .1 per cycle. So it's very, very nice. And the most surprising thing is now the following. Uh, you can also apply a potential to the gold. No? So you can, I mean, normally this is a catalytic process. No? It works well if you just put in the gold, but you can apply an electrochemical potential here. And if you apply the electrochemical potential, you can tune the back reaction. You can tune the back reaction over at least two orders of magnitude. You can make it fast or slow. Yeah? But this is all in a catalytic regime. It's not in a regime where you have electrochemically triggered back reaction. So we are not really sure how this works, yeah, but we find it extremely uh, fascinating. So you could imagine that there's some absorption of ions or the field does something to the absorption state or so, but it's absolutely unclear. If you have uh, smart ideas, um, very welcome. So with this, I'm at the end. I hope um, I could show you a little bit what you can do uh, when you um, combine uh, surface science um, experiments with in situ spectroscopy on microscopy um, in liquid electrochemical and photochemical environment. And uh, let me uh, yeah, mention the people that did all these beautiful experiments. So um, I would like to mention particular um, the group leaders, Jaroslava Lika, she's, re she's responsible for all the synchrotron experiments that I showed, Olaf Brummel. Uh, for the all the electrochemical experiments, and Tanja Bauer for the in situ spectroscopy experiments. Uh, the PhD students, um, people that left the group and um, contributed uh, a lot, uh, a lot of cooperation partners. I mentioned some of them, uh, funding agencies. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you for your kind attention. I'm very happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jörg. So we have questions. 
ça Ouais. Hello, thank you very much for your very, very interesting talk to me. Uh, I have two very quick questions. Um, the, the substrates for the IR investigations you perform on monolayers and sub monolayers of molecular species, they must be reflective, they must be metallic, or can be any kind of material, for example, oxides. Yeah, uh, that's a very good questions. Uh, question. So as we normally do infrared spectroscopy in a reflection, um, metallic substrates are the best substrates uh, that you can use. No? So um, ideally they are metallic. Now we're using a lot of oxides. Um, this works because these oxides are prepared in form of thin films um, and they are relatively thin. No? So even though that you have a oxide on the surface which is just a few nanometer in thickness, the Optical properties are mainly the, uh, the properties of the metal, no? so it's still a mirror. So this is uh, um, where these uh, systems work really beautiful. No? So in principle, you can do this also on bulk oxides or on non-metal. I mean, we, we used uh, graphite, for instance, or um, you can also use um, oxides, but then uh, normally the spectra are not as good. No? So you, the, 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 field, the, in the field at the interface is not as large and, and this is not so perfect anymore. Uh, okay, thank you. And the other one is uh, if sh I you showed some results at different temperatures for the switch, I, I think. Uh, can, you so can you change the temperature? Can you heat, but can you also cool your samples in your setup? Yeah, um, so can you heat, can you cool? Uh, well, for the ultra vacuum experiment, this is not a problem at all. No? So you can easily cool to 100 Kelvin or below with nitrogen. You can heat uh, till your sample melts, yeah, it's no problem. Um, <coughs> in electrochemistry, heating and cooling is always uh, an issue. No? So, uh, so far, we, we do not have a setup that allows uh, for heating and cooling. Um, in principle, that is, possible, but um, I mean 99% of all electrochemical experiments are done at room temperature for good reasons, and uh, actually we're thinking about setting up such a system, but of course it would have to be in a range where you do not evaporate your solvent, and we're working here with dichloromethane also, so th there's not much of heating, uh, maybe cooling. Yeah. So th it, it is in principle, what we can't do it, it would be would be very helpful to be able to do it. Um, yeah, we need to put some effort into the development there. Thank you very much. So more questions? I have one about the, I think it's the platinum particles, right? So you said that um, you look for the disso dissolution of the particles. You see actually a little bit of dissolution of the cobalt oxide. So when, when you think about uh, thermocatalysis, you think about particle aggregation. That's also a mechanism of de deactivation of your catalyst. So what we should look here in the electrochemistry the business. So you also see like, because the particles are somehow mobile, that they are aggregate. What kind of things you are looking here for when you think about the electrochemical system? Yeah, what, what we would need to do is, of course, do systematic experiments on the uh, on the particle density and size as a function of these conditions. Yeah, so we have not done that for this system. We have done that by electrochemical SDM for first system. So for gold, for instance, we have started to do that exactly. Yeah, we would need to do that. Um, uh, it would be interesting. Yeah, so what you normally see is the typical behavior for um, for platinum is that you ramp up the potential the platinum is oxidized, you make a surface oxide, and then you go to lower potential, again, the platinum is reduced, and in this uh, reductive part of the cycle, there's typically uh, a lot of dissolution. Yeah, so you think form a lot of um, soluble platinum species, and it goes away. And as this is in a flow, uh, it will be carried away. Yeah, so with each of these cycles, we you will lose um, noble metal. So if, if, if it doesn't go away, you have the platinum species in the liquid above, and then, of course, if you reduce it again, you can have redeposition. Uh, so it will very much depend on how you operate this experiment. I see, I see. I mean. Thank you. 
Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. One is uh, about the uh, topic about Platinum Island uh, in immersion that you developed in Atelier. I was wondering why do you need the synchrotron radiation because the, the signal is very low? Because you show that in uh, your setup uh, you make this. Because now I see that here the signal is very low, but in the previous. Uh um, in yeah, the yeah. Uh, okay. I well was wondering why, if when you want to do this kind of experiment, if synchrotron is important because you expect that for this system the the signal is very low. This is why you, or yeah. you can do in whichever lab. Even so what is the advantage of do using the synchrotron? Yes, this is well, um, in, a, in a nutshell, um, the, m the acquisition times are way shorter than in a, in a lab machine. So you want to be surface sensitive, so you can choose the photon energies that give you the, ah, okay, the best so surface sensitivity. Okay. Um, um, the acquisition is much faster. And on top, you can change the photon energies, as we have done here. And uh, for instance, do some sort of depth profiling so you understand what species are at the top and which are in deeper layers in the system. Okay. No, so it's the depth profiling, the uh, photo, uh, photo um, energies that allow you um, uh, to optimize uh, the cross sections uh, and the acquisition, acquisition times. And then there are a few other tricks. Yeah? So for some experiments, it's good to have specific photo energies where you can do special experiments resonant experiments and so on. So there, there are a lot of, uh, uh, it's, it's much better. It's in principle, okay. you can do it at, at a, in a lab, but it's, it's so much more efficient at the same time. Okay. And I have another question for the other topics. You, you, s you told that uh, you can check the if the with ERAS, if uh, the molecule is lying down or it's uh, standing up. I was wondering, are you using polarization of light to understand this or you what we are using? You you yes. speak very fast, uh, but I was, was just curious. This is, uh, this is ex exactly what you what what you what you're using. Um, so you you have the infrared light. Um, you can you can change the polarization here. You can go to S and P polarization. Uh, you have a metal here. On the metal, um, the uh, electric field is perpendicular to the metal surface. That's the metal surface selection rule. So you can only see the, 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 the component of the dynamic dipole that is perpendicular to the surface. And by comparing that to the expected bulk or to the bulk spectrum, you can derive the orientation of the molecule at the surface. This is the one thing. So you can, um, this is, so to speak, the intrinsic polarization at the interface that gives you this orientation information. And the other thing that you do in this experiment is you can change between S and P and in the S polarized spectrum, you s also you see the species that are in the solution, no? so you don't see the species in the bulk. Yeah, so you can separate um, the species that are in the solution from those that are in the surface. Uh, so basically, in this experiment here, we change the polarization. No? So you see these bands here uh, in P polarization, which tells you that these species are really at the interface no? because you all, all the time you go through the s you go through the solution and if you see a band it could still be a band that is in from a species in solution and you have to make sure that it's really at the interface and this is what you need the polariz polarization for and uh, also another curiosity i'm not uh, very familiar with the uh, electrolyte solution though uh, uh, how uh, does affect uh, your measurement in ERAS? Do you have uh, a reduction of intensity for or the for this wavelength? Does m does matter? Uh, you mean the electrolyte or the solvent? The so electrolyte, uh, the solvent. Is yes. Uh, yeah, you have to pick solvents that are um, compatible with your experiments. I showed some solvent, some experiments in organic solvents, and I showed some uh, experiments in water. This is uh, experiment in aqueous solution with. Uh, certain concentration of the ionic liquid. Uh, so um, the as water absorbs the infrared light, there are certain spectral regions that you cannot use. No? So they it's just black. And you have the region have to use the regions where the water is transparent. In the end, you're only using a thin film, typically of a thickness of a micrometer, of few micrometers. So there are regions where water is sufficiently transparent uh, so that you can do, but uh, for instance, around 1600, you have the deformation band of water. It's uh, not usable uh, basically. Generally. 
Right. Oh, one more question. I have a curiosity. In your last research, con congratulations for your research. All of them are very interesting. But uh, the top material on the gold, what's the conductive? Did you measure this? In the, in the, last, in the last research, the I'm not sure I fully understand the spectrums, uh, the, the questions, so it's... You uh, don't have losses. You can over and over the... Yes. Uh, you don't have any loss. Oh, did you mas measure the conductive of this material on, on the gold? Con uh, the con con conductivity, yes, sir. The, the, the conductivity... Um, this is this is a solution of this. Um, this is this is a is a molecular species that is um, that is in solution. Uh, it's a, in um, uh, acetonitrile in this experiment with a conductive salt around. No, so it's an electrochemical experiment with a conductive salt and um, and an organic electrolyte. So the conductivity. Um, I'm not. 100 percent sure what it will uh, whether it would tell you something the conductivity doesn't come from the molecule it comes from the from the supporting electrolyte okay uh, so what we can tell is um, that the surface is, uh, is is stable so this is the structure of the gold before and after the experiment and, and there's no corrosion uh, we, you see a little bit of deposits that you think is some um, some some con contamination that is deposited on the gold, yeah. But the the gold is not affected, no? so it's structurally stable. The conductivity comes from the supporting system, and the molecules we don't don't see any decomposition of the molecules. So you can look at the infrared spectra and see if you, if there's any loss, and there's there's no loss. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, thanks uh, Joachim Bud again, please. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is going to be Professor Victor Caroso from the PUC University, from the um, Pontificia Catholic University in Rio. And uh, uh, Victor did uh, his uh, uh, physics course, like a bachelor course in Sergipe University. And later on, he moved for the doctorate degree in the Federal University of Rio. And there he started to work as well as a, a, a um, um, research in the laboratory of Raman spectroscopy in the National Institute of Metrology here in Rio, in, Caxias, in, in Duque de Caxias. And there he was working most of the time with graphene and graphene nanostructures and characterizing these graphene nanostructures uh, with Raman spectroscopy. Later on he moved for, for his postdoc uh, to, to Pennsylvania University, working with a group of uh, Carone, uh, Tejones, right? Uh, and there he spent like a year or, or uh, one year, right? One year, uh, work on this uh, this subject with Raman spectroscopy and, and graphene nanostructure. And then since uh, 2015, right, he is back in Brazil in Rio in the PUC University, working his own group in 2D materials. And I think we're going to learn about what kind of uh, growth and characterization he's performing in this 2D material. So, Victor, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, I, I will talk a little bit about my research for the last uh, five, five, and six, five years. So, I will talk a little bit about synthesis of these two-dimensional uh, two materials and about some uh, optical properties like Rama spectroscopy, specular mode generation. So, it's a little bit different from surface science, okay, but we still have a very few materials in, in these results. Uh, I split this uh, presentation in five points. I will give you some introduction about two-dimensional materials. Uh, I will talk a little bit about synthesis, ion techniques that we de developed in your lab. Uh, I will show you how to use uh, phone scattering to measure defects in monolayers of molybdite selenides. And also how you 
how you can use second harmonic generation to measure the stacking order of multi, uh, multi layers of uh, these 2D materials. And at the end, I will talk a little bit more about RAM spectroscopy and um, bismuth telluride systems. So, uh, two dimensional materials today uh, has a, a very huge family. So, we start um, in 2005 with this work of Guy Minovozelov. Uh, two dimensional materials can be uh, think about uh, a very thin layer materials that can be stable at room temperature and uh, at uh, normal pressure. So here's some examples. We have uh, uh, niobium diselenide, uh, graphene. These two are uh, same metals. Uh, HBN is an isolated material. Uh, cuprites, uh, HBN and cuprites are isolated. Uh, moly disulfide are a semiconductor, and moly oxide are uh, metallic. So uh, we have now a huge family of two-dimensional materials that can be exfoliated and, find, uh, and found at uh, room temperature and atmospheric pressure uh, uh, sta st stable. No? So uh, I select here three different uh, two-dimensional materials. First one, it's more famous. Uh, it's the famous, famous one, the graphene. Graphene is made made by carbon atoms. These are uh, carbon atoms that are arranged in this hexagonal form. If you look at the lateral view, they uh, have just one atom of thickness. Team uh, uh, this, uh, it's uh, transition metallic cocogenide materials. Uh, they are made for one transition metal plus one decalcogenide. Uh, the calcogenide could be uh, sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. Uh, this type of material is a little bit different. If you look at the lateral view, uh, they have three atoms of thickness. Okay. Um, here another one is HBN. HBN is a, it's a material formed by boron and nitrogen. Uh, it's, it's like this. Two, uh, they have this hexagonal shape. So, but here each corner has one boron or one nitrogen atom. Uh, and for the lateral view, you can see just one atom of thickness. So, uh, why these uh, materials are important? Uh, because we can find uh, very different uh, electronic characteristics of these two dimensional materials. Graphene is the same metallic. Uh, they, ha they have these two bands here crossing the Fermi level. Oh, uh, some people uh, also call the uh, semiconductor with a zero, uh, zero gap. For, for TMDs, like uh, moly disulfide, uh, it's a semiconductor. So uh, they have a direct band gap that could be around, uh, for moly disulfide, it's uh, 1.9 EV of band gap. But the, the range could be one uh, electron volt to uh, uh, 250. Uh, 2.5, uh, no, infrared to uh, visible light. So HBN is an isolator or a semiconductor with a huge band gap. So it's, it's a monolayer form. The band gap is around 6 AV. So you now you have these uh, different materials and you can mix. No, you can select what you have, what you want to study. Uh, another character important uh, characteristic of these two materials is the phonon band structure. Uh, how the atoms uh, vibrate in the crystal. And so he in this first uh, the first line you have the band calculation of band structure of graphene. Graphene has um, two atoms of uh, unit cell. So as a result, you have six branches, six uh, phonons branch. So he in this axis, uh, you have the uh, high symmetry uh, lines, gamma point, k point, m point, uh, first brilliant zone. Um, how how you can access these uh, uh, these characteristics of graphene? You can do uh, Ram spectroscopy. Ram spectroscopy is one technique that you can uh, probe uh, phonons in your system. So here is one RAM spectra of graphene. Uh, we have these four points. The G, G line points are uh, peaks that came from gamma point here. 
around this, this one. So D and D line point point are um, peaks that came from the effects. So if you have the effects in your system, you can uh, see these two peaks here. Um, what else? For uh, moldesulfide, uh, moldesulfide has uh, more branches. So more branches here. If you do RAM, you can see these two peaks that are uh, characteristic just for moldesulfide. So around 400 RAM shift, 450 meters. And for HBN, HBN has one very characteristic peak around um, 1,350. So uh, the idea here is if you use RAM spectroscopy to characterize this uh, phonon uh, structure, you can, uh, you can identify if you have graphene, moldesulfide, HBN, because each one has one very specific peak or very specific set of peaks. So uh, I, I will talk a, uh, uh, more about Roma in this uh, presentation. So now how you can obtain uh, these two-dimensional materials? One technique that we use uh, at PUC is the synthesis by CVD of, uh, in this case, of molydisulfide. So we uh, develop uh, one technique that you can decrease the synthesis temperature. So the idea uh, for the synthesis is use uh, sodium as a catalytic uh, to decrease the synthesis uh, temperature. So the idea here is it's quite simple. We have a furnace, one quartz tube, oh, one quartz tube here inside. Here inside we have uh, uh, two precursors, uh, monoxide and uh, sod sodium nitride. So here at the center furnace we have uh, this temperature. We keep it in 500 uh, Celsius. Uh, a little bit in the left side here you have a heating belt that you can heat. Uh, the sulfur powders and argon flow carry the sulfur powders to uh, the center of the furnace, so where you get our uh, samples here. So the idea here is uh, we use uh, sodium as a catalyst to decrease the temperature. The normal temperature of synthesis for TMD is around 800. So if you just put sodium in your system, you can decrease to 500. So uh, here, uh, some two parameters are important in this synthesis. One is the ratio between sodium and molyoxide. If we increase uh, the this ratio, you can we can get some very small dots here. This is the feed for uh, for the growth. So you don't you don't want uh, we do want this kind of thing. So the triangles are very. Um, there's not a clear shape. There's some points here that are more than one monolayer. So uh, the e ideal uh, ratio between sodium and molyoxide are around 0.3. So when you use this um, ratio, you can get very clear uh, triangles, monolayers in your surface. So uh, here is one type of uh, monolayer you can get, this uh, triangular shape. Uh, if you keep this uh, parameter here, it just increases the time, you can get this uh, these films. Uh, these films could be uh, something like one millimeter high. So it depends your your application, or your study. You can grow isolate single crystals or you can grow uh, films. So it depends on your application. No? So what's the idea? Uh, Max Moutinho did some VFT calculations to see what happened when you put sodium in your uh, molydisulfide system. So here it's uh, the yellow... Uh, Yellow dots, oh, blue dots are the sodium. So the calculation here shows that when you increase the ratio between sodium and moldisulfide, the energy formation decrease. So you can decrease the temperature of the synthesis uh, um, in your system. So here's some characterization about these uh, results. So here, when you have just a triangle, we did AFM. To saw, uh, to saw the step, the step is around one nanometer, is uh, typical for one monolayer. So we did Raman spectroscopy. Uh, here in Raman we have two peaks. One is an uh, out of plane peak, it's A prime. The another one is E prime. The difference between these two peaks give you the number of uh, layers. So here's some Raman maps for A prime and A prime E prime. Uh, you can see here this is a very homogeneous 
It's a perfect uh, single crystal. Uh, also, we do some uh, PL spectroscopy. PL for uh, monolayers of uh, molydisulfide has a very specific peak around 1.9. So it's a direct semiconductor. So the photoluminescence is high for these uh, for these guys here. Uh, here another uh, image for PL. So this characterization uh, gives us the the right uh, the certain that we have monolayers of uh, Molydisulfide, and these crystals are uh, single crystals, and they are isolated crystals. So for films, uh, we can also grow films. You did this characterization. Uh, here is AFM. AFM saw some dots. Okay, it's not a perfect film. But for gram and PL, looks like homogeneous. So you we, we can grow something like millimeter or two millimeters of uh, size of these uh, monolayers. So we also we can we can characterize the, the amount of defects. Here's a Roman spectroscope for single crystals and polycrystals. This, this peak here, uh, LEA peak around 200 uh, centimeters, uh, gives information about the number of defects. So we count the we did some several spectras around our samples, and you saw this almost the same amount of defect for uh, for single crystals and films. So we also uh, did some electrical characterization. Here's some typical semiconductor uh, curve. Now, if you increase the band gap, the the current, the DC current increase. So uh, at the end, we have uh, we have single crystal films. If the characteristics, the crystalline characteristics, are the same that you can find in the uh, literature. So. Here's just uh, to show you about one new technique to grow this type of materials. Okay, another result is the uh, is a little bit more complicated about uh, phone scattering in def uh, by defects in this monolayer, molydiselenide now. So uh, I work with Braulio, that is here. Uh, in these systems, we have uh, we grow uh, single crystals of molydiselenide using a helium. At the metro, you can induce defects in your system in a control control way. So, um, Brown, you can induce bombard uh, the the single crystals, and he knows what the, what this parameter is. This LED is the distance between the effects. Um, if you decrease the LED, it means that you have a density of defects high. Okay, it is. This is the distance between the effects. If the LED is low, it means that your de the density of the effect is high. Okay? And you did RAMA for each one of these uh, samples. So what we found was uh, new peaks can emerge in the RAMA spectra when you increase the defects. Look, here uh, we have, um, I highlight this D peaks here, D5, D4, D2, and D1. So it's this one, a, a prime peak, it's a first order peak. We know the origin of this peak, but this new peak here was unknown. But we know that when you increase the amount of the effects, the, pres the peaks uh, uh, start to increase. So here for this range of Roma shift, if I look for, if I look here for another uh, range of Roma shift, uh, it's almost the double. We can see this, uh, nothing happened. So this peak, it's a uh, silicon peak. I here, around uh, 550, 600, uh, we have this uh, this zoom, this LED for 10 here. We have the double frequency of these peaks, D2, D3, D4, and D5. And I call this set of peaks uh, D prime peaks, okay? These are D peaks, these are uh, D prime peaks. Uh, uh, which is the difference, the difference that when you increase the number of the effects, nothing happened here in this region, but you can see a new peak in our spectra. Here is uh, the set of D peaks, um, normalized intensity against the LED. Uh, it's clear that when you increase the density of the effects, the intensity of these peaks increase. Here, here for D, two, three, four, and five. So the behavior is quite different. If you look for A prime, A prime, we know the origin of this peak. So when you increase the density of the effects, A prime decrease. 
say this war happened because there is not this speak is not related to the effects uh, in these systems I, and here uh, we have the frequency of this D set of peaks against the LD uh, they change a little bit here around this region so here is a zoom and I plot the frequency against the LD uh, comparing with D prime uh, divided by two so the idea here is these two peaks, the set of D peaks and D prime peaks, came from the same phono, but the origin is a little bit different. So D peaks uh, are D peaks are uh, emerge due to the effect, and D line peaks uh, D line peaks not, but the branch, the phono branch are the same. Uh, look, the behavior almost uh, it's very near, you know, the behavior and the difference of the A frequency it's very near one each other if you compare. So the idea behind this, uh, you have uh, this mechanism, this Roma mechanism that you call a uh, double resonance process. So for double resonance process, we can find peaks, these D peaks uh, in cap point with brilliant zone. So um, you are happy here. If you, uh, if you can uh, induce these peaks here, you need, uh, you need a defect in your system he demands structure of, uh, of a semiconductor. Uh, he the mechanism is uh, if you have a light comes here and excites one electron uh, to the uh, conduction band, this electron uh, you be uh, scattering by one defect in, in an elastic way for another point of the uh, zone. And the electron here now it's back scattering um, for one phono with opposite momentum and decay emitting another photon. So in this case here, you need a defect to scatter one photon on your system. Uh, e another way to, uh, that you have a double resonance process is, is, is if you have two photons with the same momentum um, in modulo but uh, opposite uh, direction. In this way, uh, you have uh, the double frequency. The idea here is uh, these peaks, these new peaks that we found was came with these branches, okay? If the, this uh, D-line peaks is, uh, it's the double of, uh, frequency of each phonons. So this was uh, the explanation. Oh. Now another topic is for uh, using uh, second hormone generation to measure the stacking order of multi-layers. So the idea here, uh, this experiment was did in McGrath in Sao Paulo by Professor Cristiano. This is the setup. And the basic idea is I if you have um, a laser line with frequency omega and pass through a nonlinear medium, medium like your TMDs, uh, you can get a double frequency uh, after uh, as an output. So the idea is the second amount generation to measure the, uh, the measure uh, how my uh, Second layer and third layer are stacking um, in this system. So here you have two different experiments. We did this second of generation uh, in function of um, the angle, okay, between the laser line and the sample. Here you have more B layer of molybdenum sulfide. The left side maybe is not clear, but on top of this triangle, we have another triangle that is um, rotated by 60, uh, 60 degrees. Uh, and you did this experiment. The second one generation, it's here. For mono layer, it's clear, it's blue. But for the second layer, there's no signal. For in the second layer here, there's no signal. There's no second one generation. Uh, here, the right side, we have three layers. We have now one, the second layer here is oriented at zero degree. If you compare with uh, the, the bottom layer, you have a third, uh, third layer, it's, it's exactly zero degree of stack. So you have three layers here. And when you measure the f uh, single harmonic generation, you saw this pattern here. Uh, blue is the mono layer, okay, you, s you can see the signal, but now the bilayer of zero, de zero degree of stacking, it's here, it's orange. The ultra layer, it's higher. So the, the question is why, uh, for zero degree, you have SIG signal. In zero, in 60 degree, you don't have signal. So 
we also did the same experiment for pyxen disulfide. So it's the same result. If you have this 60 orientation, there is no SAG signal. But if you have uh, the second layer in zero degree, you have this uh, the signal is uh, orange one here. So uh, also you you did Rama to characterize one on the layer two and three. So the idea behind this, if you have a, a non-central symmetric material like the monolayers, the most of monolayers, you have this SIG signal. But when you stack these um, two materials in AB, AB4, something like this, so you shift the second layer and you have the AB, now you have a, a central symmetric materials. In when you have central symmetric material, there is no uh, SIG signal, okay? But but if this your second layer is stacking something like this, uh, a a prime stacking on the second layer, it's exactly the same on top of the bottom layer, and in this case you go back to a non-central symmetric material, and so we have a SAG signal. So the idea was, okay, if you have uh, two uh, triangles that are not uh, Misaligned, misaligned, you, know, you have zero degree of mismatch between these two uh, triangles. You have SIG, so you have AA prime stacking. So in this kind of shape, you have AA, AA prime stacking. If you uh, have this 60 degree of orientation, the stacking is AB because there is no uh, SIG signal. Okay? So we can use SIG to characterize how the stacking is in your um, by layers, three layers, and so on. So the, uh, the last part is uh, use Rome spectroscopy to characterize a um, few layers of this topological isolator, this multipolarized. So the, um, this is the crystalline structure of this multipolarized. We have this uh, hexagonal shape here. Uh, each cryptoclin layer of these materials has five atoms of thickness. Here's the synthesis. This is it's, uh, quite simple. Uh, here it's a low pressure CBD. We have a pressure around uh, 100 millitos. In pass flow here, it's uh, argon flow. At the center of the furnace, we have abysmal telluride powders. Uh, so uh, the powders uh, uh, evaporate and deposit uh, at the silicone piece here near the, the powders. So at the end, you have something like this. You have uh, your silicone piece with many different crystals, different shapes and the thickness. Here, one example of a hexagonal shape of this uh, bismol telluride. So the idea was, okay, let's check the Rama spectroscopy for each layer from five to 25 uh, thickness and see where, where you got. So for uh, this type of crystals, uh, we have these four uh, peaks, but you can see s just these three, three ones. Uh, we have these uh, eight two peaks that are out of plane peaks. These are here. Uh, the second, is this a E prime uh, E two G peak? It's it's a E plane peak. Uh, the frequency here around 100 uh, centimeters, and we saw here a little split, uh, a break of the generators of this uh, this one here. Uh, probably they they do it to uh, strain. Uh, here the bottom is 60 uh, centimeters. We have this A prime A one G. It's another out of plane peak. So here are some statistics from this, this picture. So here it's a plot of the frequency of that peaks against the uh, thickness, or we can change here uh, using this uh, transformation. So the peaks change a little bit. So you can use, uh, you can adjust these curves here. Here's not uh, one adjustment, but you can adjust these curves here. You can. S uh, plot some uh, frequency against uh, uh, thickness, and you can identify the number of layers in Rama. No? Another uh, important point that we found was uh, when you use different laser excitation and uh, measure the intensity of uh, the A2, uh, A2 uh, 1G peak, uh, for the red line, you saw this enhancement, it's around eight. Okay, this not happen if you use uh, red, uh, red, uh, green or blue uh, laser line. So what ha happened here is uh, what we call uh, resonance Rama scattering. Uh, probably uh, when you use red one, the red laser, uh, you match two electronic uh, bands, 
your uh, bismuthal right so that the, the reason is uh, there is was uh, your peak was increasing here so the idea here is uh, probably when you change uh, the thickness of uh, bismuthal right the band structure you change a little bit okay so uh, i summarize the, the presentation so i show you how to uh, synthesize some monolayers at low temperature so you can characterize the stacking order of your TMDs using SIG. So you can also use Roman spectroscopy to characterize the defects in your uh, monolayers and use uh, Roman also to characterize the phonons in this multi-telluride system. So it was a little bit short. <laughs> so I finished. <laughs> uh, thank you. So thank you very much, Victor, for the talk. So the first one is from, from Emilia, please. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I, um, I have some question. You, you said that you can uh, make these defects on, the, on your uh, thin film 2D material. What is the purpose for this? What can you use for? Sorry. <laughs> the idea, uh, once you have the curves, adjust these curves, you can characterize the number of defects in your system after the synthesis. So after you can check if your synthesis is, was effective, if your. Ah, OK. It's okay. kind of calibration to know it's if that's. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, in the last example that you gave about uh, this Motelluride, you you said that uh, you you measure as a function of thickness. In this case, your synthesis thickness is equal to the time you deposit. No, no How do you calibrate the thickness? Uh, for a AFM, yeah. we did AFM to characterize the number of the thickness, and also we did ra the Roma. Uh, uh, th here, th thickness is uh, in nanometers. Is Here's AFM. So we have the crystals here. So we did AFM. We got the the, the okay uh, profile, the profile, profile, the height, the so height the profile yes. and also uh, after that you did the Rama for that crystal. So we, we can choose where to put yeah, we can choose each uh, crystal. Ah, okay. Because it's big. It's uh, four microns, twenty microns. Okay. Is the optical spectroscopy here? Okay, thank you. Next one, York, then, then you. Maybe to this sample, can you um, explain a little bit more detail how this synthesis works? So um, the material is uh, bismuthalluride, and then there's a flow. Um, uh, so it's uh, what what is happening there? Here's a vapor uh, chemical deposition. It's quite simple. So it's, it's just evaporating. A the material is yeah, just, just evaporating. Evaporate okay, yeah, and low then pressure. you ha yeah, but then you have the substrate which is silicon silicon or oxide. Yes. Silicon yes. oxide, and then the material grows there. So how does it? Uh, it nucleates somehow, and then it grows from. So is is there any way of controlling where where no. it starts or? Yeah, there is no way to control. At the end, you have a sample like this. We, ha we have like many different crystals with many different uh, thickness. Uh -huh. I, I cannot control the, the number of layers. That will be an interesting um, approach uh, because we, we look, we're starting to look into these materials a little bit um, dip by deposition by ALD and so on. So the nucleation is, is, uh, is the critical part. So uh, I guess it would, um, it probably uh, nucleates at some defects or yeah, some, some yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, they, they seem to be very rare. So you have so large islands that you have, uh, the, the, it's not the regular defects, it's, it's just some, something very rare, uh, very rare events that you have there. Yeah. yeah. But you have no idea what, no, what is behind yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult synthesis. <laughs> I think I spent six months to, to get these results. Uh, no, you can go on. Uh, but th then if you, 
if you choose a metal substrate, because that's the way I also would like to see this, some of these systems to be investigated with other techniques, this doesn't work, right? Or you need the, su the silicon substrate to identify with the optical microscopy. So it's the same story of the graphene, that you need the, the, uh, the silicon yeah, oxide. Yeah, it's the same story. Right. But uh, people cannot like to do like nano pattern or, or implantation that can provide the defect for nucleation, something like that. People don't I do I that. I never see something like that, but pr probably yes, that you can do and you can right. control the seeds, no? And Hi, Victor. Hello. Thanks for your talk. Um, can you identify the kind of defects do you have or just the, the density of defects? No, no. In this experiment, no. For us, defects would, could be anything. No. Uh, okay, thank for you. The, for this experiment, no. Yeah, so uh, for this experiment with the stacking layer, so you know that we also do like this polarized RAM here. And wh why uh, polarized Brahman would be a possibility to, to identify this, this stacking sequence, or SAG is the only technique that you see that it's would be able to do that? You, you can do with Rama, but depends the system. Could be very difficult or no. Depends the system. But SAG is very clear, no? Here you have the signal, no signal here, signal here. That's it. But for Rama, should be more careful and depends the system. Right. So the selection rules are more like straightforward to identify the system or, or not. I see. But I think it's possible. All right, and then and that defects that you said the two phonons. Uh, there are more questions, and otherwise I'm going to do one more. Yeah. So the the, the two phonons process that you uh, uh, rise up. Yeah, this here. So how you see this double resonance process here? So I mean, uh, when you do that, you would need something like nonlinear effects, like you have high intensity laser beams or you measure as function of the energy of the beam, the, uh, the, the, the uh, yeah. Difficult to, uh, to, to use this, uh, if you use different laser lines here, yeah. mm -hmm. you probably will not see anything because the, the brains are uh, flat. So most bands here are flat. If you choose the laser line, the excitation laser line, you expect to see a little bit, the phone is a little bit out of K point. So the shifts will be very small. So it's different from graphene. Graphene was easy. You just turn the laser line and the band, the D bands uh, like change a lot, you know. But here was difficult. We did this experiment, but the shift was like one centimeter, two, two or three, and it was very difficult. And finally, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, compound with so, uh, sulfur, usually when we think about like a UHV experiment or whatever, they are very reactive. So n you are uh, shining laser on top, and over time you see changes in your sample. So they are stable that much, because these are very no, reactive uh, compounds, yeah. right? So how is that? You, you did this uh, experiment like in the same day, in the same day and fast. Otherwise, it's it's it's, it's otherwise uh, it'd be <laughs> it'd be difficult because uh, it's more diselenide. The selenium easily uh, oxidizes, you know, and goes away. So okay. Okay, so one short experiment. No, no, it's not <laughs> one short experiment. But okay, uh, there are more questions. If not, let's thank the, the speaker again, Victor Caroso from Putin. So I would like to thank very much all the, the speakers to take their time to come here and, and also you to, to take your time to come here and then to have this discussion. I hope we see each other anytime soon. So if those that want to like to see some of our lab infrastructure, can look for Caio or Guilherme that's over there. Otherwise, see you next time. Bye.